right, hello everyone, and welcome to the very first episode of the Back to the Blockbuster podcast. My name Let's is go. Oli, and I'm just going to get right into it, because uh, Back to the Blockbuster is not just a one man, it is a two men and a lady. In the spirit of letting ladies go first, Brittany Katz, would you like to introduce yourself? Putting me on the spot already. All right, I'm <laughs> just a big setup. <laughs> to bring it. I'm, I'm Brittany. Uh, I am one third of this podcast. Uh, I'm really excited to dive in and talk about, uh, especially today, some uh, female topics and uh, get that going with you guys and see <laughs> if you even had that perspective at all or um, I don't know. I just, I think this will be an interesting conversation. Yeah, she was even ready before we started. She was like, I got to save this for the podcast. I don't want to say this yet, but she's- I was getting a little heated. I have- Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she's about to- the screen if you can see it yeah I, was a <laughs> I came prepared and then you have an interesting perspective too because like you work within the industry so you have that perspective as well yeah I've worked in the industry for I guess almost 10 years now um started in Missouri and worked my way to LA nice so it's a place to be for it <laughs> yeah I kind of reached my peak at Missouri I guess I <laughs> couldn't really do much more there with how much can you do in Missouri for? <laughs> yeah, what what's like the leading studio there? <laughs> Is there anything there? <laughs> it's uh the woods. I don't know. <laughs> the woods. Blair Witch a Project horror, filmed in Missouri. A lot of horror projects. A lot of horror movies. Yeah. Nice. Bond Girl. Yeah. Oh well, there you go. Good. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. Bond Girl under Missouri. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> I didn't work on it, unfortunately, but it was filmed in Missouri. Cool. Um, are you jaded by the industry at all yet? Or are you uh, are you still? So, um, I think I did go through a phase where I was a little, I was, I was, I got a little stuck in the mud, uh, where I was like, I don't know if this is for me, especially being a woman in this industry. There's, uh, limited, limited roles, uh, unfortunately, that will allow for a woman to do, which we're working on. If the industry is working on it, still. <laughs> still um <laughs> it's a never ending, never ending battle it's a never ending battle for sure especially with pay uh i've had i've had people tell me i can't hold the camera because it's 50 pounds oh what oh. i'm not gonna name any names <laughs> but, but i have been someone. told that because i am a woman the job would be much harder for me because the camera is heavy, heavy. Mm. so jesus that's dumb that's ridiculous. Wow. Yeah, but I've made it, and I'm still in the industry, and I actually like what I do. And you're here. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, Owen, uh, secretly a child actor. Is that why you're here? <laughs> uh, I am not a child <laughs> actor. What's up, guys? What's up, back to the blockbuster. I am Owen Erickson. I am uh, really good friends with Gaius and Brittany, um, and just really excited to be a part of this. Um been talking about movies with Gaius ever since we became friends and I actually watched uh, Whiplash right before this um I also watched Let's Go to Prison if you guys have ever seen that movie <laughs> um that is it's like a kind of a deep cut Brittany I know you're a um, armchair expert fan it's a one of Dax Shepard's first movies with Will Arnett and it's yeah. definitely had a few laugh out loud moments so it was just Some just kind of getting ready Illinois. yeah um and it was uh it was fun it was it's I'm just excited to talk about some movies and hear your guys' perspective, but also uh, on a little bit more of like the inside scoop and stuff, but also just willing to give my opinion because I think that, um, I don't know, I have a lot of, lot of stuff to say. So looking forward to, especially this first episode and just can't wait to get started. It's been a long time coming. So let's get after it. Yeah. So Owen has like an interesting perspective because he pretty much represents the everyday movie or he has no ties mm -hmm. to the industry. No ties. No work ties at all. I think we all have a lot to say and a lot to learn when it comes mm -hmm. to each of our perspectives. Exactly. And honestly, exactly. like uh, people like Owen are the ones that are really like driving movie going right now because you know yeah. don't want to listen to critics or listen to people that work within the industry or write for press. Hey. So, you know, with uh, with all the comments out there, Gaius, we were kind of talking about before we started, but I mean, everyone's a critic now, so yeah. people don't like to think that the critics know what they're saying. I mean, I, I do think that there are some critically acclaimed movies that are critically acclaimed for a reason. And there's certain things with cinematography or screenplay adaption that uh, is, is very important and that should be acknowledged. But 
I think that every which like every person has their own perspective now. And I mean, we're the ones who are going to be buying those box office tickets. So it's kind of up to us to decide whether or not a movie goes, um, makes money or not. And whether or not that's a streaming service or actually heading to that brick and mortar theater. So I'm just ready to give my perspective and, um, hopefully I, uh, agree. And hopefully I disagree with some of you guys and it sparks some conversation. Well, I'll definitely make it more fun. And you're right. Yeah. Too. Because like anyone can be a critic now. Like you yourself could go on Twitter on a film's opening day and be one of those people that can give either a really positive opinion about it or a negative one. And that can kind of influence how the film does like the rest of the weekend. Like you can instantly get like that kind of opinion out there. And, mm-hmm. and like, so anyone can kind of do it now. And like, you know, I know a lot of studios, which is why there's like always like embargoes on like social media, like yeah responses and stuff it's now if they know the movie's good they'll lift the embargo very early yeah but if I, they have a feeling that it might not be so good yeah <laughs> no i i mean i think it's that um to lift it. yeah uh, i mean i think that um no matter what marketing is effective in and of its own way um i can see a trailer and say it looks good i mean i i was excited to see eternals uh ever since the trailer because i thought the trailer was awesome but word of mouth is going to be my biggest swayer, no matter what. If I have a friend that I respect their opinion, I've enjoyed movies with them before, and they say something like, hey, I didn't really like it. No matter what, I'm either going into that movie with already a negative connotation, or I might not even go see it. I might just wait till it pops up on my, now it's on Netflix now, instead of going to the movie theater and seeing it. So I think that word of, word of mouth is always going to be that really, really a critical critical point for myself when talking with some people that I really like to watch movies with or also enjoy movies themselves. And anytime they say something positive or negative, it's going to affect the way that I walk into that theater. Yeah. Especially if you have similar interests in them in, in film as well. Mm-hmm. I get such bad FOMO too. If people are talking about something and I, I, I haven't seen it yet and I can't talk about it. Oh my gosh. Especially when I was in film school, it's like not doing your homework the night before when you're supposed to watch a movie for the class and then you didn't watch it now Mm -hmm. everyone's spoiling it for you but yeah you could have gone to see it you could have watched it right Uh, i had that problem when um when avengers endgame came out it came out uh like the thing was like the wednesday or thursday when it opened the day before like in previews or whatever it opened when i was going to stage so i could not watch uh avengers endgame until the monday when i got back Mm -hmm. to and then I had to block all kinds of spoilers. Turn your phone off. Yeah. And then I was like, okay, no one's going to really, it's stage coach. So no one's really going to bring it up. And we were like in line, like ready to get food. And then this girl was like, oh yeah, I saw it like right before, like we came down here with stage coach. We started talking about it. I just turned around. I was like, please. So had to go. I was like, I don't know you. I'm sorry, but please don't talk about it. But that's how. Show especially up. with Marvel movies. Those can, yeah. I mean, that, there's big spoilers with that. Especially like mm-hmm. a definitive one like that. Like I was like the, you know the last of the big ones until they come to this next phase. So I was like, just please mm-hmm. talk about it. It's uh, funny. Cause I think that there's also some kind of people that they have that uh, sort of angst. Like there are some people out there that have still never seen breaking bad and they don't even care if they're spoilers. They're like, I'm not watching it. I'm not doing it because everyone said it's good. Yeah. And I think, I think those are funny. The people like people who still haven't seen game of Thrones or sort of those big TV shows. They just kind of say, listen, I didn't see it. And, I don't want to see it. I, I've always been interested in sort of that angle of. Um, I think I'm the opposite. Like if I haven't seen a show like Game of Thrones, I still haven't watched Game of Thrones, but uh-huh. I still have every intention to watch it. Like, so I don't have, do you have three <laughs> weeks? <laughs> do you, yeah. Do you have three weeks of nothing to do <laughs> and hours and hours? Of I know downtime? that's the thing. I have it, but I don't want to hear any spoilers because I want that opportunity for How me to not? actually get to watch it. I've avoided spoilers. But I will say something like Breaking Bad, there's the 10 year rule where it's like, it's been out for 10 years. The Sopranos is the same way. Mm -hmm. These types of shows that have been out forever. I'm sorry, but these are going to get spoiled for you. You had Mm -hmm. time. You should have watched it. Yeah. Game of Thrones has not years yet. Is is the 10 year rule? Is that a a very good mark for that? Like if you have the 10 year rule, you can use that for movies, TV, anything. Is Is that your rule or is that like a industry Thing. I think it's an industry thing. I've, okay. I I don't want to say that I've coined that term because I've definitely heard it from someone else. But yeah, um, it's it's a very important thing. Godfather for you, like you, <laughs> like you can't be upset. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I didn't know that happened. Well, you should have because it came out in the seventies. You had. I mean, even <laughs> movies like My Cousin Vinny. Like, yeah. There's a twist, and if you haven't seen it, 
That's your problem. Yeah, uh, I, I ruined the sixth sense for someone, but, but it came out. I mean, the, the movie had been out for like fifteen years at this point. Yeah, and I mentioned it casually because I thought that like everyone had seen it at this point. Well, I think it's also one of the most well-known twists of all time. Yeah, and that movie's that not it's made there. fun of in every TV show. <laughs> so, I mean, if you don't know it at this point, you're living under a rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can't watch the movie knowing the twist; it ruins the entire movie. So, I yeah. apologize to that person in question. But here's I could rewatch the movie knowing the twist, and I still, I still find it. See, here's a the good point: time. I haven't seen The Sixth Sense. Oh, I'm glad. Oh, well, you know what happens, right? Yeah, I mean, he's oh, dead okay. the whole time. Okay. I was like, God, I say anything. Spoiler <laughs> alert. <laughs> yeah, no, at this point, it's my fault that I haven't seen it. <laughs> you should but still I, watch I also, it. I also will say that I, I have stayed away from it a little bit. Like, it has been on streaming services, and I have had the ability to watch it. But I know the twist. I, I mean, it doesn't take away from how amazing the movie is and how good uh bruce willis is and uh Haley joel osmond and like all those amazing actors who were became like majorly successful either during or after it but since i have found out the twist i have kind of said maybe i'll watch something different I and mean, I, I still haven't seen it yet and like shaman has been chasing that twist ever since that movie like i mean i'm not yeah. saying he hasn't made good movie since but he has like i love Unbreak. he hasn't i love <laughs> he's been chasing that like i need to have like that moment again and he keeps trying and trying yeah sometimes he does well like the ending is split is very good because you know yeah. you know unbreakable you're like oh shit that i like that yeah like, all back to that movie but like you know he's still trying desperately to hold on to that uh to that twist and but i also think he got kind of typecast as this director that has twists and so yeah. He he kind of has to incorporate one or else. If you watch one that doesn't have one, you're like, well, what's the hook? what was the point? <laughs> <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> There's no yeah. twist. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, well, speaking of you know those critics that we were talking about, I my name is Gage Bowling, and I actually work for press, so I'm kind of in the position to be critical. I, I worked for Joebo.com now for over a year, and then before that, um actually started my own uh, Instagram page called G-Rills, uh, which kind of built its own following. Uh, kind of, that's how I actually got the Joe Blow stuff, is they saw that and, like, would you like to write for us? I was actually going to start my own website, but then realized that's a lot of work. So I'm very <laughs> happy, uh, very happy that someone reached out to me to write for them. And it's been a lot of fun. I've learned a lot. Um, I kind of was in the position that Owen was in, because even though I went to film school, and stuff like that. I've always watched things more from like an audience perspective, more than like being hypercritical about um, all the nuts and bolts that go into movie making. Like I can appreciate it and I can acknowledge it and I know it, um, but I'm a little bit more, uh, I guess, easygoing when it comes to that kind of stuff. Like I won't watch Transformers and Harry like, seven. Yeah, hey, like, Michael Bay was the highest paid celebrity for like three <laughs> years after those two Transformers movies came out. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I kind of come from it from that perspective. But, uh, you know, it's interesting because like I'm trying not to like, you know, Brittany mentioned about being jaded. There's certain things about working for press that kind of jaded me a little bit because there is a lot of uh, the, the industry kind of is like very symbiotic that way with press. So, like, you know, there is a lot of kind of like like, hey, you like write this about us and like, you know, we'll give you access to this. There's a lot of that, which I'm still not totally like into because it almost feels like, oh, I feel like I'm being like fake a little bit trying to uh, maintain a story, but it's just a part of the, the game. It's part of the business. So I just have to accept it. You can uh, interview a lot of actors and actresses and directors as well. Yeah, yeah, that too. Uh, and and luckily, you know, so far I've I've liked all of them, and I haven't had to like, you know, I actually had to haven't had to interview someone really. Well, there's one. Never mind. Where I didn't really like the movie. There's one. I don't want to say who it was, but there was one. Like they had me talk to him like after I right after I watched the movie, and I basically just talked around. <laughs> I was like, oh well, you're in it. <laughs> How was that? <laughs> uh, so well, I saw you cool. in the movie. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. You you, you were can... running around doing your thing. <laughs> like, thank God it was only four minutes because I don't know if I could have stretched it out any longer. To... <laughs> I have a lot of respect for you guys, though, when it comes to that because I I would have a really hard time. I there's a lot of people in the industry that I really respect, and I think it would be really hard for me to meet my heroes, as they say, and and have that that interaction not go as planned. You know, I, 
that's a very scary and intimidating thing. And I have met a few people in my in my line of work as well. And it's been very short interactions because I don't want to ruin anything. <laughs> yeah. Do you have, a, do you have an example of, do you have an example of that, Brittany, where it kind of went maybe a little longer than just like a hello or a, just maybe some small talk, but do you have an example of something that you, you kind of saw them walking across you're like, Oh my gosh, this is so-and-so. I have a friend, this isn't my story. So I'm, I don't want to go into too much detail because it is someone else's story, but um and it was a good interaction. They met Billy Bob Thornton Mm. and um, I'm from St. Louis and he's actually a really big Cardinal fan. Uh, So that was right away something they could talk about. Uh, He's from Arkansas. So he grew up with the St. Louis Cardinals. So uh, they actually were able to make conversation about something that had nothing to do with film or TV. And I think he liked that Um, because I have heard interesting things about meeting him. So that to me, when my friend told me that, I was like, oh my gosh, you were able to find something to talk to him about. I would not have known that. <laughs> Some sort of common ground yeah. to mm-hmm. break the ice. Yeah, because I mean, sometimes they like to talk about themselves and and whatever you're doing. And sometimes they just want to be a normal average Joe and just talk about baseball. And I think that's really cool. Yeah, that is cool. I mean, But at the same time, they're in the line of work where it's hard to be a normal person. I mean, unless if, if you're a international superstar, I mean, it's, you can't really go to the grocery store without someone saying, Hey, I loved you in this and this, or I, this was my favorite movie. You kind of got to get past it. So I have respect for the people that are able to sort of break down and, and have those very humble conversations with, with just an, an everyday person in order to kind of say, Hey, listen, I'm normal too. I just happen to be on the big screen. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's cool too because what what I was told by our managing editor on the site, and he he was like, when you're talking to them, like we both know that we need each other. Like it's like they need us to promote their stuff, and you know we need them because like getting them on our site builds traffic for the site. So like you both kind of know that you need each other. So there is like a lot of like respect already. Like for the except for the most part, people don't go into the junkets and stuff like that with like an attitude or like they don't want to be there they might not want to be there but like they won't show it like some people have shown it I guess I haven't had the experience they have where they've said they've had like tough interviews where they're like the longest four minutes of their lives they thought because it was a struggle to get through but like for the most part they all know that like you know I got to promote the movie it's a part of the job or tv show or whatever so they're usually pretty cool I mean I haven't talked to anyone that wasn't cool yet the one that was interesting for me, Gaius, was when you interviewed Nick Kroll for um, Adam's Family 2. And that's not your typical kind of movie. So do you have some sort of like, what's your mindset going into? I mean, it's a kid's movie. And I, when you break it all the way down to it, I mean, there's adults who are playing characters. But right. I, mean, I mean, my favorite Nick Kroll stuff is like the very adult Kroll show and the league and so how can you not mention that kind of thing you have to talk about Adam's family I I feel like that would be an impossible task for me to not say hey listen I've loved you for everything you've done except this right you get you get the emails like right before the interview starts and they'll send you like all the press assets for that particular person in their movie Mm -hmm. Um, they'll tell you what you're allowed to talk to them about and what you're not allowed he had no restrictions but there was only four minutes and like you know like they really wanted him to talk about the movie yeah and, uh you know i you know the movie wasn't entirely for me but it was a kid's movie so like it wasn't made for me but i was able to just pull stuff from it to like just ask him about uh and kind of get his like the, the, i guess the interesting thing that he talked about was um i asked him what was there a difference in like kind of voicing the character uh in the movie from the first movie to the second movie and he actually yeah. gave a detailed response as to what it was like because you know they don't record with each other like all the actors are done separately for most animated movies mm-hmm. he said by the time he did the second one he already kind of saw what charlie stern had been doing and oscar isaac had been doing so it was easier for him to kind of give a more reactive performance he also got to see the movie he also got to see the first one right right so, so he kind of got to see how the animators uh, translated his voice and he could kind of pick that up and maybe progress on that a little bit. Right. He's such a good voice actor too. Uh, I mean, big mouth. He's so good. <laughs> he's like yeah. one of the kings of it. It seems like, like he's voiced a lot of people. Um, and there's a reason why they keep going for him for stuff like that. And I will say like, like something that was family too, like the voice work he does in there is great. I mean, he's funny. Like, you know, it's just 
wasn't something that's necessarily made for me but you also if it's not made for you you're gonna have to kind of have that respect of like yeah you know, I also had to review it, which like usually I don't have to review the movie. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes they want me to. They're like, I could tell the managing editor didn't want to take reviewing it. Probably didn't want to watch it. <laughs> so he was just like, hey, why don't you, do you want to just do it? And I was like, sure. And I was like, please, I hope I like it. And I didn't hate it. It just wasn't something that's made for, you know, a 36 year old. It's just like- I think I got so used to that in film school, watching movies that I didn't like or genres of movies I didn't like that. Um, I kind of learned to respect the craft more than I, I try not to say that I don't like the movie or that I hated the movie, especially I, I, I won't, you won't catch me saying I hated that movie just because I didn't like it. Doesn't mean someone worked hard on it. Someone really put everything, their blood, sweat and tears into this movie. And just because I didn't like it, it's not my cup of tea, but it's someone else's. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I learned that the hard way in film school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't think anyone, you know, goes into, I mean, I guess there are some movies that are purposely made to not be that good, but I don't, like, for the most part, like, I don't think anyone goes into making a horrible movie. They think they've got something worth, uh, worth telling, I guess, and it yeah. is kind of, like, I, I, read, I read certain critical reviews that are, like, they get really harsh. Like, it's not like, uh, it's almost like do you have like a personal vendetta against the person who made it because yeah. it's really not, it goes beyond you like not liking it like now you're going you're going into details that have nothing to do with the movie mm-hmm. like, it's just like you hated the thing that they did before and like it still lingers so you hate this too <laughs> it's like so it's personal crazy. <laughs> Brittany, i'm interested what's one can do you have like one that you they said hey you got to watch this movie and you were just like oh, oh. you were like oh oh yeah i do not want to been- watch this immediately immediately this film comes to mind and and we played this game in film school where we would go around and say like the movie that everyone is supposed to like in film school that you don't like and like for me that movie is a clockwork orange stanley kubrick it's a hard one i mean i like it's (laughs) it's not for me it's not for me (laughs) it's for other people that movie is not for me if you've seen it you know if you haven't, you should watch it. <laughs> um, it's, it's a, it's there's a, a scene. There's a scene in the movie. There's well, there's a couple questionable scenes in the movie. It's been ten years. Scene, you can say whatever you want. <laughs> I mean, this isn't a spoiler. I'm gonna say it. But there's a scene in the movie where he has to literally have his eyes held open mm-hmm. to watch this this mo- other movie. That was me watching the movie. <laughs> <laughs> like you just felt forced. Like you were like, wow, this yeah. looks so familiar. And you have to watch it for sometimes these movies that they're just, you know, so art house that these teachers are like, we're going to watch it in this class. And then another teacher is like, we're also going to watch this movie and not knowing that they're both, they're both watching the movie. So sometimes I would be assigned it twice for different classes. Like, Jesus Christ, there's so many movies. Yeah. See, that's (laughs) how I feel about, that's how I feel about Wes Anderson sometimes is yeah I, I, feel I feel like i i mean his movies there's like the um he's shoved down our throats for sure the the hotel what's that one um the budapest. Budapest hotel. yeah budapest uh, amazing i mean it's a great movie but then he comes out with another movie and the filming is just so unique that it's it's i mean it's it's impossible to not say oh that's a wes anderson movie but i think sometimes it's made for art's sake and i just kind of get a little frustrated with the fact that every actor is like, oh, I can't wait to be in a Wes Anderson movie. And I'm, maybe it's the fact that he, the way that he directs his actors or the way that he is on set and the way that he kind of sees the the film from his lens. I mean, that might be it, but just, I, I kind of feel like he makes a lot of movies that to me seem very similar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, he's very, and art, definitely for the art house crowd. Like they, and it's called like Artois or some art. Yeah. Uh, I think that's what, yeah. Artois, uh, directors filmmakers that have a specific a certain aesthetic and they stick with that aesthetic for all of their film mm. and bill murray just works so like over and, over and over again yeah <laughs> people must like yeah he, he clearly has like people that love working with him and love his stuff i mean like i mean i like mm-hmm. Tenet bombs that's like the one i like the most out of his whole filmography but like so which one the, the royal Tenet bombs i think that one's really good but I like the cast in that more than anything. I think like it's more like their interactions that I enjoy. Um, I don't think I've ever watched one of his movies and 
like really like he's not one of my favorite directors but like, a lot of people do like it like one of the guys on the website wouldn't let anyone else review the french dispatch because like, i don't trust anyone else to review oh gosh so but he's then, even pretentious in the fact but that then he the won't problem let anyone is, review it but then the problem is when it comes to someone like that who 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 likes everything he does no matter what it is is they're not going to maybe write an honest review if they right. don't like it yeah. um it, it's like it's like liking a baseball team only when they win it's like you're gonna have to you gotta like this baseball team for when they lose when they win no matter what and mm -hmm. you have to be critical of that so if you're really into a director like wes anderson you have to be critical on his flaws as well mm -hmm. Well, speaking of being critical, um, a little independent movie opened over the weekend uh, <laughs> for no money. You know, I don't know how it got made. <laughs> Rust. Uh, uh, but Marvel's Eternals came out uh, <laughs> over the weekend. <laughs> Sorry, I thought, you were, I thought you were talking about. Uh, I thought you were talking about Rust. Rust. Oh God, no. <laughs> Starring a small actress named Angelina Jolie and a bunch of other people. Um, I've heard she's on the up and up. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. She's going to do big things one day. Mm -hmm. um, the good news for Marvel, to get that out of the way, it made $71 million this weekend. It's the fourth uh, best opening of the pandemic this year so far. So, it's, and it's funny too, because the other openings are held by Marvel or Marvel or Marvel adjacent movies. So, Venom is number one right now with $90 million. And then, uh, and then uh, Black Widow opened with 82, and then Shang-Chi followed like with a little bit less than that. What was Dune sitting at? Uh, uh, opening weekend? Yeah. Uh, Dune made like $41 million a week, which is good for, you know, for the. Is that, in, is, that, is that considered including the streaming? No. So, like, HBO, like HBO Max or Warner Media, just like with any streaming service, unless they want to brag, brag, brag. They don't release like the data for that for some reason. Mm. Like there, there's a uh, company called Samba TV. It's like a third party company that can get some of the data because it it measures like analytics from like certain smart TVs. Mm -hmm. but, like most of these places, like keep all that kind of close to the best, except for like they didn't do it when Black Widow opened. Like when Black Widow opened, Disney was like, "Well, it made thirty million dollars on Disney Plus," and I think they want to prove a point that like it opened really well, and then it also did really well on. The platform yeah but if they're not going to release any other data then we don't know in comparison what that means exactly so like and like, that's why they're doing it right so 30 million dollars sounds good um but it's just like we don't know like compared to like what other stuff they've done like you know for something like Mulan or like jungle cruise like we mm -hmm. don't know how well it's actually doing on streaming yeah like most of those services will brag about it eventually like they'll like especially during like their earnings call like after every quarter they'll be like well you know, this many people watched it in like its first 30 days and yeah um, but they won't exactly they'll like sometimes they'll send out a press release like oh it was our like the most watched thing on amazon prime but they won't have anything like well what how much what are you comparing it to like it could, it could have been watched by like one extra person that made it the most watched thing on amazon prime so you just like kind of or never, if you watch like half of it and then end up turning it off because you don't like it it's like right, walking it's out of a movie theater like samba tv they only count like people who watch like with like the first few minutes of it so like, you could have just turned it on for two minutes and like oh this is not for me and turned it off they're gonna count well, it's it like the, the when the tomorrow war came out it said the number um, the world's number one streaming movie right now and i mean no one's talking about it a week later right exactly well eternals got lucky because i know there was a lot of there was talk about putting it on Disney Plus, and I think Marvel was very confident in what they had, um, or felt confident in what they had. Um, the good news for the movie kind of stops with how much it made opening weekend. I mean, it yeah. also made like 162 million like globally opening weekend, which is good. But there's a lot of signs that kind of indicate that it's going to have a steep kind of decline in the next week. <clears throat> um, what happened after the LA premiere is that they lifted the review embargo on, for online for you can go on social media and say like whatever nice thing you want to say about it or negative thing but you have you couldn't be like you couldn't be too detailed you have to like kind of be vague and just say either you liked it or you know it wasn't for me whatever usually after like an la premiere like most of the social media stuff is really positive because i think they want to be like you know you were just at a premiere with like all the stars and yeah. like the director in the studio so there's a lot of like kind of flattery that comes after that Mm -hmm. um, so the initial word from what seemed like from the critics was that it was very strong 
And then as it kind of got closer and closer to like its release date, I think it started at like 75% fresh on Rotten Tomatoes and it just drops and drops and drops. It's been it plummeting. Until this weekend. And I think it's sitting at like 48% rotten now, which is like, it's officially the first rotten movie of uh, the MCU. MCU. Like even Thor The Dark World has a better rating. I don't know. I keep throwing that one under the bus. I'm sorry. But that's usually considered the one that- Well, people, it's- Or Iron Man 2. It's like like- those are the ones that people tend to like the least. Um, a forty-eight percent is not good, and no. uh, not passing. <laughs> seen the movie on Saturday. Certified rotten. Um, it's the issue isn't how it's made. It's uh, it's directed very well. Like it's it's visually it's stunning. It's like it's if, if I could only grade it on how it looks, like I would give it a positive review. It's just the issue is that it's it's too long, and you can have a movie that's too long and have it still be interesting throughout like dune is really long but i never thought it was boring yeah uh internals drags like the pace is like it's a glacial pace at certain points where like yeah. not a lot happens they're not and i want to be that guy who's like oh there's not enough action blah blah but there there's a lot of like down moments in between all the action and since there are 10 main characters it's hard to uh i mean it's hard to make them kind of stand out they don't have enough time individually to make you learn much about them like i told you guys before we started like i can't think of like most of the characters names in it mm-hmm. and, like, and these are people that actually had a lot to do like in battle and stuff like that they were on the screen a lot yeah but there was just nothing about them that stood out like i i, I told you uh oh and yesterday i think like how do you have someone like angelina jolie who was a big name but she's essentially like the seventh lead and yeah. doesn't do a lot. Like, I mean, like, she's in it a lot and she's in a lot of the fight scenes and stuff, but she doesn't have a ton of lines. It doesn't mm-hmm. seem like something like she would kind of take. Ten uh, main characters is a lot. I mean, that's especially big names like Salma Hayek and Angelina Jolie having to share a screen with eight other people. That's, mm-hmm. I mean, it is hard. I don't, I, I, I haven't seen the movie yet and I don't know who else is in that besides them because I've only seen them doing press. So if they're not going to be in a majority of the movie, that's a little misleading mm-hmm. with their marketing poll. Right. And I will say the press for them, they that, that even though the other cast members have done press interviews, the ones that are being pushed out the most are Angelina Jolie and Salma Hayek. They're actually paired together for most of the press junket. Mm-hmm. And I think the interviews that have been shown the most. Now, I know people probably know that Kate Harrington is in it and mm-hmm. uh, Richard Madden is in it. They have, they have that Game, Game of Thrones connection and stuff like that. Yeah. And Kit Harrington is not in the movie a lot, but there's a lot of like set up for who he will become uh, mm-hmm. in the movie. There's a, actually a lot, of the, a lot of the movie, especially the last 45 minutes, is a lot of set up for what's going gotcha. next. And that's like, a lot of setup though. 45 minutes. Of so setup? they're hoping nice. for like 10 full setup. Yeah, um, exactly. Spinoffs. Right. And so that, and that kind of brings the point of like, like the movie got like so there's a there's a company that surveys like opening night audiences called Cinema Score. It actually has the lowest cinema score out of any Marvel movie. It got a B, and I don't know if it doesn't sound bad, but it's not really a good grade for like Marvel standards. It doesn't indicate yeah. that like, order mouth is like good, extremely strong. Like mm-hmm. if a horror movie gets a B, that usually works well for that because it means that you know like most mainstream people, unless you're a horror fan may not like gravitate to a horror movie and be like oh yeah whatever it's a c whatever mm-hmm. but like something like marvel uh getting a b that kind of indicates that like not just critics but like the general like movie going public didn't exactly love what they saw yeah i mean so I think is that, it... oh I was, I was just gonna say i think that um just just kind of going back to what we were saying about with uh salma and angelina not having a lot of lines I think that there's a lot of chance that they signed on for the fact that they are now part of the Marvel universe. Um, and now they have that sort of notoriety and that big paycheck and the chance to come back for pretty much any other Marvel, Marvel movie that's out there. Um, let, let's just say there's another end game sort of movie where every character is involved. I mean, there's always a chance that now they're going to get that big paycheck down the road. So I think that that's, that could be a reason that we got those big names. Um, but I mean, I, I think that, and we can kind of go into this a little bit more, is that with the fact that these, like this spinoff or Eternals having this new sort of universe being introduced, I mean, everyone knows Spider-Man, everyone knows Thor, everyone knows the Avengers, the Hulk, That's those are household names, but these characters are deep comic book characters. Yeah. And 
I think that if you don't really know them, you can't relate to them as much. And so it's hard to sort of really throw yourself into this world when you, you didn't necessarily even grow up with them. Right. And I also think yeah. too, because like when they announced the movie, I, the first thing I thought when they announced it, I'm like, this is going to be a tougher sell than most of their other stuff. Cause I, I didn't even know much about them. And I, I used to collect comic books and I, and I like Marvel stuff, but I didn't know much of anything about them. And now someone's defense of that was like, well, with Guardians of the Galaxy, I didn't know anything about them either, I guess. And that ended up working. Uh, but it also wasn't 10 characters. And uh, but I will say, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry to cut you off, but I, but I will say, and I was just thinking this while you guys were talking, um, if they had maybe done the backstories of these 10 people, had Angelina Jolie be her own movie star of her own movie, and then did this Eternals movie after we had some backstory to some of these characters, maybe we would be a little more invested in that character mm -hmm. of like Salma Hayek or Angelina Jolie or um, Kit Harington or any of them. If they had their own individual Black Widow, Thor, the Hulk, then we would want to see more of them interact with other storylines. Yeah, I actually saw a YouTube breakdown of why DC has failed versus Marvel. And it actually brought up your exact point, Brittany, where, I mean, they made the Justice League and they introduced Cyborg, The Flash, and Aquaman. I mean, Aquaman got its own movie, but that was actually after Justice League. So, mm -hmm. I mean, they kind of introduced this plethora of characters and no one, you, you don't really have the sense of, oh, I'm rooting for them. You're just kind of like, oh, I just see this new character now. And like, what makes me invested? And it, yeah. it kind of dove deep into the fact where Marvel did it right, where they basically made you care about these characters before they all came together. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, I agree with that. Cause there's like, there's a lot of like meticulous timing that went into them setting up like the Marvel cinematic universe. They, they didn't rush it. They like gave a lot of them their own solo movies before they even had uh, the first Avengers. Um, there was a lot more time. And I'm, I'm not saying that they're still not taking their time, um, cause it seems like they know a lot of this stuff ahead, like the way they plan out their phases, they seem like they know kind of where they want to go. Um, but this was a, I agree with that kind of breakdown, but it is weird to like have a movie like this with that many characters. And even if the movie is two hours and 37 minutes, it's just not enough time with it, all of them to give them a significant, like enough backstory where you care about them. Like, I won't say who, but there's someone that like bites it pretty quick like in the group what and, there, and there's like a there's like this big emotional thing about yeah, it hasn't been 10 years yet you can't spoil it <laughs> there was a, there's a, but there's this big emotional moment for this person and i didn't know anything about him so it was hard to like care that like this person died so yeah. i was like i just was like well i mean i i guess he was important to the group because they're all they're all very upset <laughs> yeah i mean even even the fact that you just said when we started this that you don't remember three or four of the characters names that just says case in point to me that... name who dies i do not remember his name i would have to so, look yeah it up. exactly so i, would I have mean... to look it up and like and the, like it's just it's a shame too because i think like marvel's been a well-oiled machine but i think but the one thing that got brought up with the 48 percent rotten score that uh the film got is that a lot of people are pointing out well are people getting too tired of like the marvel stuff now maybe that's the issue um, because this year alone with like TV and movies, you had WandaVision, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, uh, Loki, you had Marvel's What If, that's all on Disney Plus, and then you had Black Widow, and then Shang-Chi, and then Eternals, and then you have Spider-Man December. That's a lot of content from one studio. But, the, but I will say, people were excited about WandaVision. People were excited and went and saw Shang-Chi. People went and saw these other Black Widow, they didn't get a 48% on Rotten Tomatoes, but Eternals did. Nice. So I do think, yes, there might be some Marvel fatigue, but I don't know. I don't really understand why if people were excited. I could see if it was a downward slope, but no, WandaVision did amazing. Yeah, yeah. like Shang-Chi has like a 90 Shang -Chi's, something on Rotten Tomatoes. Exactly. Like, uh, it wouldn't have done so well if people were tired of it. And I hate to say it, but it, I think this was just the rotten one of the bunch where people just were not interested in it, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But 
maybe it can make a comeback later when they do more backstories and people go back and watch it or they make a these spinoffs that people are wanting to see more of these character storylines or something yeah i mean like obviously you make a good point Brittany. like i was trying to think that wandavision and loki were successful because everyone loves those characters and so i was excited to see those because they i feel like they didn't get enough time like, i love them before they got their own show and i was i was thinking oh i want to see more of them so that's why I was I was invested. But Shang-Chi, I, I mean, no one had heard of that story or that sort of character before, but it still did phenomenally. So there obviously has to be some sort of fundamental problem with Eternals that it just didn't work. It just didn't work. And, and it, yeah, and unfortunately, um, it is a female director and it feels like another punch in the gut to right. two female directors. Um, because I think people are a little more critical of them and um, there aren't as many. And so we're just fighting for our lives as women in this industry to yeah. just prove ourselves. And I think Chloe, uh, I think she did a really good job and she is a very good director. I mean, she won best director at the Oscars last year. Um, she doesn't have to prove anything to anyone, but I do think there does come this unfortunate case where people do find out that she's a female director in this male dominated Marvel universe and they don't like it. I think that you bring up a good point when I think there's a lot less slack that's given to female directors. I'm like, I mean, let's just, for for, yeah, JJ Abrams or Steven Spielberg who directed the fourth Indiana Jones. And that was a, huge flop no no one liked that movie as much and he's still steven spielberg so no one really bats an eye but you have someone like the wonder woman director who directs one of the best movies ever in wonder woman and then makes 84 and then people are kind of thinking oh did she make it now she got her 15 minutes of fame and now it's up it's like there's sort of a disconnect in the fact that they don't have as much room for failure <laughs> they take the out like, patty- like away from them really quickly so everyone like when the first mm-hmm. wonder woman came out everyone was just like hooray patty jenkins and well, i think like, people forget DC universe for a second because like no one liked uh batman versus superman people kind of were iffy on men of steel but then they finally made this really good one and you know she was at the head of it and you know she got a lot of like positive notices after that and everyone was propping her up but then Wonder Woman 1984 comes out, it's not good, but it's almost like whatever achievement she had with Wonder Woman was just like snatched away from her, like like that. Well, in Wonder Woman, the first one, and I don't know if this is a known fact or not, but she was one of the first directors in the universe to not get signed on for a second film at the same time as the first. And because they didn't think that it would do so well. They didn't have faith. And you know what? I think 1984 would have had a lot better of a chance had she been able to maybe film both of them at the same time or written both stories at the same time. But there was not that there was not that guarantee for her, like other male directors in the past who were who were able to take advantage of the same film sets and the same environments and film a little bit of one and two at the same time. And I think there is that you know, we were knocked down. We had to start a little bit lower on, on a few lower steps than the male directors who were given a little more inches. Yeah. um, Bringing up your baseball analogy, Brittany. I mean, I literally just watched Moneyball last night and I mean, he brings up a quote that speaks exactly to that. I mean, he says, I can't manage this team under a one-year contract basically saying what's giving me the right to like make this team the best that I can. If I think I'm going to get sacked at the end of the year. Right. Um, and like, I'm putting out the best team I can so that I can do good in job interviews the next year. So she was probably putting out the best movie she could in Wonder Woman, thinking that, oh, well, now I'm going to have to go and find another directing job doing something different. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there, there's got to be some sort of resentment for the studio that she had and yeah. sort of this. Well, now I got to kind of start from scratch because then they kind of after it was good they're like all right let's do another one and she's like all right well now i gotta come up with an idea and find a story and find this whole thing after it did well because they had no plans to do another one another great example of this is the twilight series right exactly first twilight was directed by a woman and it's the best one 
Yeah. It's like critically awesome. acclaimed best one. <laughs> I mean, it's people say it's the best it's one. The best I one. mean, that's a common theme. Yeah. And it's the only one that was directed by a woman. Well, Why they really, didn't I have the same director. Yeah. I, they should have had the same director for all of them just to stay consistent. I think that was crazy that they changed so many times. But I will disagree um, in the fact that Harry Potter had different directors and they all did great except for the fourth one. Those were, those were, were oh my gosh, those were released so far away from each other though. Because the book had to come out, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> I yeah. don't know if that factors into it, but. Yeah, I was just trying to think that, I mean, the third Harry Potter movie came out and it was such a change, but a needed change from oh, those two. Happy-go-lucky wizarding world to, hey, they're serious now and they're about to get eaten by a werewolf. I was not all in yeah. until I saw that one. I, I remember when I saw the first two, I was like, yeah, this is not for me. And then uh, I was like, all right, I'll give the third one a shot. And it's just so like totally different. Mm-hmm. like it's just like visually it's just different it's more grown up but i mean i never read the books right so everyone that read the books they're like dude they get older of course as they get older the storylines will get more like darker as they get older mm-hmm. i think you'll enjoy mm-hmm. it as it goes so i think that's an that's an example of where different directorial uh takes can actually be successful but in the in the example yeah. of twilight it didn't work right you know, and I actually, I will say, I, I, I did go on a Twilight binge, so I have seen all of them. Oh God! <laughs> like on your own, like for like, no one forced you to. <laughs> yeah, no one, no one had a gun to my head saying you gotta watch Twilight. I, I was like, you know what? What's the hype? And then, <laughs> and what? then I finished it, and I was like, what's the hype? Well, you know, they made, <laughs> well, they did make a lot of money. They're not. Yeah. You know, I didn't read the book, so maybe I can't judge it. I, they're just not good. <laughs> not I didn't read the book, Brittany, but you, I saw the movie. I was going to say, Brittany, did you read the book? Because I've heard from I actually, people that the writing is not I have read a lot good. of books before the movies, and that is not the case for these. Yeah. was never into um, the vampire stuff as a, as a kid. What do you think is the draw for vampires? Because they, like, there's something that has to, I, I got to say it, there's some sort of sexual nature about vampires that draws people in where it's like, I don't know if it's the neck biting or something, but no matter what, it depends on who it's vampires, I mean, vampires, vampires got a date will always with a vampire. be in. Right. It, it depends on who it's sold to, right? So, like, if you look at stuff on the CW, like the Vampire Diaries and Legacies, they cast very attractive people to play these roles. And Brad Pitt played a vampire. Uh, yeah, Brad Pitt I mean, played, played, played a vampire. Yeah, so it's, like, always someone, like, aesthetically very beautiful. That's I'm one of the weirdest that. movies I've seen. So, like, they're the, very, like, the... they're visually, like, just from, like, the, are you, you know, if you're just looking at something good to look at, there's, like, they, there's that hook for, like, most of them. It's like, oh, I'm a thousand years old, but I still look like I'm 20. Yeah, there's that underlying thing that it's, like, sexy, and that's what I think it's is. It's, like, the... a sexual thing, like, the it's biting and the, yeah, like, the, biting, the desire. The, I look young, but I'm old, and I'm going to make you old forever too like you're going to be mine forever because now you're a vampire yeah it's, it's it some appeals sort to of... women it appeals to women in a different way it appeals to men where women are more emotional so it appeals to us emotionally and desirably hmm. um just a different part of our brain that it, it yeah. it's like i want to get my neck bit by tom cruise <laughs> <laughs> no brad pitt <laughs> over tom cruise, for sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe if it turned out an all vampire cast, it would have done a lot better. Yeah, you know, um, I do feel bad for Chloe Zhao, the director, though, because for some reason, like Variety, and this is even before what they wrote recently. I don't know if they just have something that against Eternals, because like what they did on after the LA premiere, which you, you can't do when like they say like, "Hey, this is under embargo, you can't talk about it." Someone from Variety like blatantly told everyone on Twitter what the first end credit scene was, like revealed it, like. Yeah, it was a big I've already yeah I saw it pretty early. It was a big deal, and like you know if that would happen like me, I'd probably never be able to go to a press screening ever again. But like it's Variety, and they know they need they need them, I guess. Um, but now yeah. they, they did this recent piece about, and I'll let Brittany kind of get into it because uh, it I like when I read it, I was just so surprised that that was the angle they took as to why why people are considering Eternals the worst MCU movie ever and like I was like that's not the angle that you should probably take because I don't think it's that accurate I think it's a pretty quick hot take um (laughs) to make that (laughs) allegation that quickly uh and it's it comes from allegation that it's the worst movie in the entire MCU universe and 
you know what from chloe's perspective though for her i will say i think that this will only light a fire under her ass to make a be- to make a movie that she can then go back and say you know i am this prolific director and i don't give a shit what you say about eternals yeah you know like you said steven spielberg can make a bad movie also george lucas i mean <laughs> He's done well for himself. I but... that he's only made one good movie and then got very lucky. <laughs> I mean, we there are directors that have that have had flops. I mean, there we can we can probably get into that later. But um, I think that she's not done yet. And Patty Jenkins is directing the next Wonder Woman. She's directing the next. Um, she's doing Cleopatra. And she's got um, this new Star Wars movie under her belt. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that we need more names to come out, more female director names. (laughs) Just to prove to someone, not that we need to prove to anyone, but. Yeah, the thing that sucks is that you, the, um, you guys have to keep proving it because you guys have been proved in the past when Zero Dark 30, or sorry, when Hurt Locker won Best Director for uh, the oscars and that was the first female wasn't that the first female director to win an oscar I believe so. um it might have been she won over her ex-husband i know that yeah, and that won. yeah first yeah. of all that's that's the most boss bitch move i could ever you oscar. could ever do right? in your life. Like, at the oscars getting people. your name called I'm just kind of being like Mm-mm, that's what <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> um yeah but i think i think zero dark 30 won as well and that was a female director and i think that i mean women have proved that they they have this ability to make movies that everyone loves, but the society just has this innate ability to just, when, when one goes bad, they're like, well, that's it. That's and it's it. crazy. Oh, yeah. And it, I mean, I don't even get, I, the females don't even get nominated. I mean, I remember when Lady Bird wasn't nominated and that was like, uh, that was a hit to our gut for sure. When mm-hmm. I saw that movie, that movie, and I mean Greta Gerwig for Little Woman, Little Women, that was probably the best movie I saw uh, that year, 2020. Um, and she and you know she put everything into that. That was her favorite book growing up. She had read that up, down, back, forth, sideways. She knew those characters like they were her own children. And um, for what her to not even be nominated for an an Oscar for that for best director, it just was incredible. And Lady Bird, she's gotten probably the most uh, hurt by the Oscars out of any female directors yeah. lately. And I feel really bad for her. But I mean, she's going to keep working. She's going to keep doing what she needs to do to get that title. But now she's like, I don't even want it probably anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I, ho- I hope that everyone continues to make movies for the sake of making movies. Um, and they want to put their creative thoughts and paint a picture with their creativeness regardless of awards um Mm -hmm. but that doesn't stop the fact that awards are what the industry is driven on and so there there are some times it's i mean if you don't like that's how you get jobs that's how you continue to be in the business so that is something that drives it but i do hope that regardless of all of this as sad as it is it's going to be a a work in progress for hopefully not ever but for the most recent future and the near future to come i just hope that people continue to make movies for the sake that they want to be created and they want to put something on the screen that shows who they are and that's the reason that i watch movies and the reason that i do it is because people actually care about it they're not just trying to get the i mean no one's watching simple jack from tropic thunder because they're trying (laughs) trying to win an oscar so um i mean like that that's what i hope is that that creativeness isn't quelled by not winning an award unfortunately right. as as yeah may, that might be a tough topic to sort of dive into but i hope that that just drives them to continue to make amazing films well like the yeah, unfortunate I mean, thing too, the narrative about like even with eternal reviews and it kind of like, got hit on a little bit in that variety of story is like it seems like the narrative when like a female director directs something like this like a you know a big budget movie that usually would be reserved for a man to do like whenever there are more like quiet like introspective moments in movies like these like they tend to point out like they're only really there because you know they had a female director like there was less there's less it was less so much talking yeah there was less it was less action driven because of 
it having a female director. And I think that's uh, bullshit because yeah. some of my favorite movies have the least amount of action where there's maybe a minute and a half total of action. Brittany, I mean, I, I sent you my review for No Country for Old Men. Some consider it an action movie, but I mean, the best part of the movie is the dialogue. And that's mm-hmm. what makes the movie great um, is because of the inter- interaction between the characters. And I kind of get your point, Gaius, when there are some introspective moments, people are like, oh, it's just sensitive. But I think that's bullshit. And I'm kind of wondering what this is going to be like for, you know, the ladies directing these movies moving forward because uh, the first Captain Marvel was directed by two people. It was Anna Bowden and Ryan Fleck. So they had, it was two directors on that, one female, one male. There wasn't a lot of stuff thrown her way because the movie was successful and it made money. And for the most part, other than like fanboy nerds like Brie Larson, uh, most people enjoyed it. <laughs> um, but now- I, you know, that. I don't get and, that. And, and I did, I did Marvel notice- coming out, Like the sequel to that, well, not coming out yet, but- it also has a female director, Nia DaCosta, who directed the Candyman remake, is directing the Marvels. And I'm just kind of hoping, like, as more of them come down the pipeline, that they don't have to deal with, like, this kind of, like, they, there's more added pressure on them to make these well and have them be yeah. successful. And I did notice one thing, too, as well, when I was reading some of these reviews about uh, Eternals, I went back and I read um, some reviews on the the Hollywood Reporter on just other Marvel movies, just to see how their writing tone huh? looked like uh, for women versus when versus men directors. Um, and I still have them up because I thought it was interesting that for Eternals, uh, it took them one paragraph to get to the fact that it was a female director. Mm. For Wonder Woman, it was. <laughs> For Wonder Woman, I think it was the first words uttered were Patty Jenkins. <laughs> a woman. <laughs> literally. Literally. And then and then I was like, well, okay, now this is getting weird. So then I went to Shang-Chi. They didn't mention the director's name until three paragraphs down. There were a couple other ones like Thor, where you didn't even know who the fuck was directing the movie until three Kenneth or four paragraphs. Kenneth fucking Branagh was directing it. That's who, that's who was directing it. But, <laughs> but when you look at these other movies, like Patty Jenkins and Chloe Zhao, it's like it's like front and center, right in the first paragraph. You can't even get through the paragraph without finding out that it was a female director first. <laughs> first and foremost, just know it was a female director. Okay, now I'm gonna tell now you. Now let's that talk about it. Huh? First, yeah, no. Like, and as someone who was a journalism about. major, that's <laughs> fucked up. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Like, I like, didn't get a journalism <laughs> degree, but I started in journalism. It's like the first thing they want you to notice. They're like, Marvel's Eternals, Eternals. Direct it sets the tone for the entire <laughs> article. It sets the tone. Yeah. Because if you read an article, I mean, if you read something, a review about a movie, and you don't know who is directing it, whether it's male, female, they, them, whoever the fuck, you're going to have your own perspective. But if you're someone that is biased towards men or biased towards women or whatever, you're going to, it's going to set the tone in your head a different way. Unfortunately, that's just how it is. Yeah. Yeah, true. Well, I mean, I, I, it seems like Patty Jenkins is still kind of going through that because, you know, they announced today that her Star Wars project is delayed. They didn't say how long uh, Rose Squadron is delayed. But it's it like busy. That seems to be like the issue. Like yeah. she's developing Wonder Woman three, and she is working on Cleopatra as well. But uh, I will say, I don't like the way that they're spinning it. The media is spinning it so that it sounds like she's too busy because it might not be her conflict at all. It might not be her problem. There are other directors that direct multiple. Mo- J.J. Abrams is a perfect example. Sometimes he has three or four projects going on as well, and those projects get delayed. Yeah. and it happens but it might not be because she's busy it might be because she didn't get a location set, like scout that she wanted or there could be so many things that play into the fact that it's delayed well i the way, the way i read that article it seemed like she's had a lot going on so i read it she as does. like there's a there's a lot of shit that she's being involved with which i'm very mm-hmm. happy about but i read it in the fact where it's like she's got her hands in like nine different pots right now and so it's hard to complete all that kind of stuff regardless of um, who you are. And I think that that, yeah, that's the way I interpreted the article. I did think they mentioned her a lot rather than the project. That is something that I noticed, but I did read it in the sense of um, it sounded like she has a lot going on. 
Um, right. There's just a lot of projects that people want her to be involved in. And it's hard to be a part of all those kind of things and stay focused when um, you're, you're, you're trying to complete all those kind of things. So th that's the way I interpreted yeah. it. The two when projects I she's on, the two projects she's on, they're big. I mean, Wonder Woman 3 will be big and Cleopatra's big too. Um, I mean, so Wonder Woman 3 the story is like of Cleopatra? Like, What is the story of Cleopatra? Like, I don't know. I mean, obviously, they're. I'm wondering what time in her life they're going to do it. There's obviously got to be Mark Antony's going to be involved somehow, but like, what? Time? I don't know what her angle on it's going to be. I mean, yeah, I'm interested to see sort of what they're going to do. There's, is it going to be an action movie? Is it going to be a drama? Is it going to be a, is it going to be CGI? Like, I'm wondering sort of what that sort of take is going to be. Because when you just hear Cleopatra, I mean, yeah. she was an influential well, woman. The, the Gal Gadot is in it. Gal Gadot is in it. She's playing Cleopatra. Um, surprise, surprise, surprise. They announced it pretty early just to be like, you know. But that is cool that she's an Israeli. I mean, she's Israeli and she's playing this Egyptian queen, which yeah. is. Yeah, totally that's agree. Pretty, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's I do agree with Brittany about the whole, the every article I read about the paging thing today was like. She's just, just kind of putting the blame on her. And then like, like the, the, uh, the negative thing about kind of putting it all on her, because there's another writer attached to it too. So it's not just like, she's not working on it alone. But the negative thing about that is then once like the internet starts to read these stories and if they already are triggered by her and whatever failure she had with Wonder Woman 1984, like I even told you guys, the comments on our thing were all negative. They're all like, Oh, like, well, well, good, kick her off of it. Just give it to John Favreau. Like, maybe it's a sign that it's going to suck. Just get rid of her while you can. Like, it's a lot. It was all very, like, all very, very negative. It's negative. And, like, John Favreau misses, do with, too. Like, it's like, you know. John Favreau can miss just as, I mean, yeah. he's not winning the World Series every year either, speaking no. of baseball well, terms. He's made the Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones. Like, they are, they're awful, too. <laughs> so, like, it, he, like, even he can, like, have a... I'll yeah. put the blame on whoever wrote the screenplay for those. That's who I'll put the blame on for those. It's just the, like, the, the, the writing in those movies is just horrible. abysmal. Well, yeah, I feel bad for it. I mean, like, they, the narrative on it, it was just very... And that shouldn't even be a negative story. Like, if, it, if a movie gets delayed, because it happens all the time. Like, if a Especially happens for every, Star It's Wars. happened to every movie in the last three years. Star Wars, I mean. they had to redo the last one completely. Yeah, I mean, yeah and like you can't, just, you can't half-ass, I mean, I guess you can't half-ass Star Wars because there have been some not so good ones, but she can't like jump into it like and ha be like attached to all these other projects. If she, if she personally, if it is on her, if she personally feels like I can't give it 100% my all, then that's good that she's like, I'm going to take my time with it. And, I mean, she's passionate about the story because like she was talking about how like you know, she wanted to honor her father, who's like a fighter pilot, like, and that's the whole angle of this Star Wars. Yeah. So she, she feels very, that Star Wars pressure. She knows that there's a huge fan base right. that's going to come for her if she fucks this up. Regardless of what she makes for this movie, um, she's going to get some backlash, no matter what. It's Star Wars. So, mm -hmm. I mean, people, if it's not Empire, people are going to shit on it, <laughs> no matter Ryan, what. Like so. Ryan Johnson is still, still get shit for uh, The Last Jedi. Even though it got really good reviews, like most Star Wars fans don't like it, and they don't like all the changes that he made. So even when he makes something like Knives Out, they're like, well, fuck him. I don't like, I don't like, look what he fucked up Star Wars. I'm like, he, this is a totally different movie now. Yeah. Like, right. Like, like, who cares what he did to your precious Star Wars? Like, it's at least he tried something different. Like, I don't necessarily love loyal that, fans, but he tried something different. I he, think he, that he, they're like, the most I, toxic I fans out there. I, I think they're loyal <laughs> to a fault. I mean, they're the kind of people that they're like, oh, this didn't come out in 1970 and I didn't see it like back then. And they're like, they think that four and five are the best movies ever made and everything after that is terrible. Yeah, I, I, I don't. I don't know who gets more triggered: Star Wars fans or Marvel fans or DC fans. I think they, they all kind of have their own trigger. <laughs> I have an answer for that. It's called Star Wars fans because <laughs> it's, Star, it's definitely Star Wars fans. Have you guys They're, ever dressed up for a movie premiere? Um, like how Star Wars fans do? No, no, I'm not that diehard. I remember the first time I actually saw that myself. Uh, like at going to like I remember I went to the midnight showing, uh, for Prisoner of Azkaban. That was the first time I ever went to a movie and saw everyone dressed up and then they could tell that i was not one of those people like you never read the book huh it was like so i saw <laughs> that like i saw that <laughs> premiere i saw prisoner of azkaban premiere this is a funny story because i um i'm a twin and so we had a lot of the same friend uh same friends growing up and i had a friend megan and she could only take one person with her and i got to go so my brother was so pissed because he didn't get to go see prisoner of azkaban we've been harry potter fans our whole life 
and I got to go see it. And I came home and I had nightmares all night because of those damn werewolves because <laughs> I was I was still young and I was just it, but it was so funny that yeah. I got I got chosen and I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm terrified. <laughs> I forgot about your age. So I was like, why do you have nightmares after watching Prisoner of Asky Band? I was like, oh, yeah, I guess. I mean, I got nightmares after watching it, man. I'm a, I'm a sensitive guy. I like to I like to get all the way involved. I, I'll, I'll have nightmares, too. It's, uh, it's I'm a sleep talker. Is. And I and the first time I watched Harry Potter, like the first three, I would sleep talk after all of them. Like I like what I would Guardian have Leviosa or like <laughs> no I I would be asking questions in my sleep like You're my like boyfriend at the time my boyfriend at the time was like making me watch them I had never seen all the Harry Potters so he was making me watch them and yeah he would he would be like trying to answer my questions he didn't know I was sleep talking so I'm like asking questions that I would normally ask if I was sober and awake <laughs> and I was asking them when I was dreaming Jesus. well also probably you did you probably didn't did you read the books no yeah so you probably had a lot of questions because i never got the answers to them because i was yeah, asleep you're like you're like why did dumbledore give gryffindor the house cup i don't get it he just oh, gave it to them <laughs> someone please tell me while i'm asleep i guess i ask my best questions while i'm asleep and he answered them and you have no idea what the answers are i think he was confused he was like why are you asking me these it's 3 a.m. <laughs> well, <so> I mean, <laughs> well, speaking of like the Marvel fatigue stuff, I mean, I, oh, I also forgot to mention that Hawkeye is coming out too. That's another like Disney Plus show. Like my boy Hawkeye is probably gonna get some justice because he needs <laughs> he needed his own <laughs> he needs his own thing. I'm like the he only Hawkeye in the Jeremy Renner plays him, mm. and like I I think I'm the only person that will watch that has watched all of those Avengers movies. I'm like, why can't Hawkeye get his own like? his own stuff and he finally is so he's actually getting a show in november which is great and then in december we have spider-man no way home and they mm. released an official poster for it today which is crazy because the movie opens next month and usually with a movie like that there's a ton of, of a, it's like a big marketing push like even early i thought there was going to be a new trailer attached to turtles and there wasn't there there's rumored to be a trailer tomorrow there's already been one trailer release that hints at the whole like multiverse storyline that may bring in you know Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield mm. and previous previous Spider-Man movies they already teased that like Dr. Octopus Alfred Molina who was in Spider-Man 2 with Tobey Maguire is in this and there's hints that like Willem Dafoe's Green Goblin is in it well we uh, heard his voice in the trailer there's a lot of like secrecy surrounding it and I think that's why they haven't put out a ton of trailers and stuff well I will say from from my perspective of my current job, um, I work in post production. Uh, the trailer is difficult to push out sometimes because if the film requires a lot of, if it's visual effects heavy, sometimes yeah. the visual effects aren't done yet. That's right. Um, so that can really delay. Like music licenses can take a while sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes it, they do want another trailer, but um, like with the Ricardo's trailer, um, a lot of people were upset that, or the being the Ricardo's. No, it was not people, Nicole. People were upset that Nicole Kidman, um, her face wasn't in it, like at all <laughs> in the trailer. Um, but yeah, the visual effects probably wasn't done. I I have a huge thing of trailers. Trailers are my vice and yet i i love them and i hate them i have a sort of a love-hate relationship with them because i love seeing trailers and there's um there's a movie that i want to watch strictly because of the trailer um it's with it's the one about this guy starts seeing visions about like a storm that's about to come. i think it's called like the shelter uh, or uh you know what i'm talking about guys yeah it looks for yeah you. but just from the trailer i want to see it it's a, it's an older movie i think but just from the trailer i want to see it but i think that there's especially with action movies and a lot of these new movies there's so many that i go and finally see the movie and i was like well i already saw it because i saw the trailer comedies comedies do that the worst they Comedy always show you the funniest scenes in the trailers yeah. they really mess up there it's like, so I, frustrating like i loved halloween kills but like just about every death is uh pretty much shown in that trailer it's so annoying <laughs> why like, did they do that no secret at all like, oh well i know so and so is gonna die because 
you basically showed about half of it in the trailer. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the case of like Spider Man, I mean, I guess there's like there's so much that people are already assuming, and even like the like Marvel boss, like Kevin Feige, he's like he doesn't want he says to kind of ruin anyone's expectations because everyone's like, okay, you're doing the multiverse, so that means that like this MCU version of Spider Man, you're gonna you're gonna throw him into a world where you know so- Sony's Tobey Maguire Spider Man exists. And Sony's Andrew Garfield Spider-Man is exi- existing, and they're going to be in the same movie. That's what everyone's already assuming that's going to happen. Um, and then there's the whole idea, like some people even think that, like Charlie Cox, who played Daredevil for the Netflix shows, yeah, that even he is going to be in it because there's too much lore. There's a lot, and, and like, and, and all these things weren't even connected at first, right? But now because they can kind of play around with, like, especially with the Doctor Strange stuff, he can kind of set up all these different things with different universes. They can kind of do this big thing and like uh i i hope it turns out well but i i kind of am feeling that they i do agree with Brittany that it could be that maybe just like visual effects aren't done that's why we haven't gotten a lot of trailers and stuff for it mm-hmm. but it's just like even when the like tom holland can't even talk about it like every time well, he's notoriously bad for yeah, he's, not, he's also bad at keeping secrets but like <laughs> every time he talks about it like he said recently in an interview that like by talking about like how I felt filming it, I will feel like I'm giving away too much. Like, I guess he said something like a few weeks ago. He that, probably hasn't seen it yet. Yeah, and he also said a few weeks ago when he was filming it, it felt like there was a finality to it, he said. Like, it felt like at least this phase of the character, like, I guess what like, he was trying to say, like this kind of like teenage boy growing up, like this version of the character, he feels like when they do another one or if he gets to do another one, that it has to be something very different because this felt like kind of like the end of like that kind so of so are we talking a death here is that what we might be seeing uh i don't i mean i hope not and and don't don't touch uh then die you have to keep her alive just for oh uh, well if that character <laughs> dies off then you know someone will be happy but no it's yeah you, <laughs> you know, um yeah there's like if he i guess he can't like if he says too much like oh, oh it felt like a finale they're gonna be like whoa then you are doing all this big stuff that everyone's talking about and then at the risk of it like of that stuff not happening people are going to be very upset if like all the things that they predicted for it don't happen i mean it's like that with star wars fans too when they're like this is definitely what's going to happen like i like and they have it all mapped out in their brains and then when they don't go in that direction everyone gets pissed off yeah so there are is the sense of like bloated expectations and there are people that want to ruin this part of the movie they want they want to know if it's actually happening like for me, I want to be surprised when I'm watching it, and it's like, well, there's Tony McGuire, and there's mm-hmm. Andrew Garfield. Like I had an idea that was going to happen, but like you don't know for sure. So far, they've all been kind of lying. I mean, Andrew Garfield was like, oh, I, have, I haven't gotten the call. I'm not in it, but you can't tell because he's kind of jokingly like, oh, well, whatever I say, you're going to get someone's going to get pissed if I say I'm not. Yeah, and then you find I'm lying, like you're going to get pissed. But like, there's they're kind of. I'd dead. be so bad at that. Power <laughs> actor. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I'd be like, I, mean, like, I don't know. Yeah, Am I in like it? The Marvel stuff, like, uh, I feel like they probably uh, have their, like bugs, and they as soon as they give like one secret away, they like get like a zap or something. Like, like don't talk about that. <laughs> like, yeah. it has They're to be wearing, to, like, like a neck, like a dog collar, that, like the shock. Like, yeah. yeah. And uh, you know what, Tom Holland. And I heard Mark Ruffalo is actually not really good at keeping Marvel secrets either. So those two were like known for. Loose lips. What I thought was interesting about Tom Holland is that after his Spider-Man character, he's been cast in almost solely American accent movies where he's not playing his traditional, like his actual accent, which is British. And I think he has a great American accent, but there's something about that that kind of peeves me a little bit where I know he's good at the accent, but I mean, how often do you see Jude Law doing a American accent? Or like, like, or you, you want, or um, gosh, who's the guy who was in all the romantic comedies from the nineties? Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like there's so many, like there's oh, so I'm many British actors to be like charmingly befuddled. That's, 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 but there's so many, there's so many, <laughs> there's so many British actors out there that have embraced it, and and Hollywood has embraced their Britishness. But for some reason, Tom Holland, they're like, you're going to be American in this one, and I don't <laughs> understand that. Well, I think it's kind of like I don't know if he, if it's on purpose like he's the stuff he's done so far i guess kind of caters to that i mean he hasn't really done like uh anything where well, he, the devil all the time i get it 
Yeah, and then like, like for Chaos Walking, why couldn't they have had a British accent? Right, and then Cherry, like he was playing. Like, I mean, that was very much the like American movie too. And like, I don't know anything about Uncharted or the game, so I'm assuming that character is he's American. American. He's gonna be so, he's like, gonna be American. I've already heard the voice in his the trailer. So like, I mean, if Jude Law was doing an American accent, people wouldn't want to see it. Exactly. Yeah, he didn't do American. Women. Jude Law is that the hook for women with Jude Law? Is like the accent. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, oh Jude, Jude Law's Law American. Especially. He's ugly now. <laughs> now he's ugly. I mean, have you seen him in the holiday? <laughs> oh, he's very common. Yeah. I can't imagine him like throwing out an American accent. I don't think that story would even work. I wouldn't yeah. even I wouldn't even root for him in Cameron. Is, is he in your top is he in your top five, Brittany? Um, yeah, I, I'd say he is. No, I, I wasn't convinced. I was not convinced with that. I, <laughs> Yeah. Well, I was thinking about like who else is in my top five, and I'd say yeah, I, I think he is in my top five. So how about American really Jude Law? Is American Jude Law in your top five? I would take him either way, <laughs> but I prefer the. <laughs> <laughs> what movie has he like? What movie does he use? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I don't, I've ever heard an American. I don't think I've heard him do an American accent. He, like in AI, he has he uses Axie's real accent. Closer, he yeah, he uses real accent. I was trying to think. Of, I know he has. Use an American accent before. I, you asked his agent, he's like, Can I talk normally or can I not? He's yeah, like, yeah. Oh, it's an American. I, I'm not doing it. So, uh, <laughs> that might actually be in his contract where he, yeah. doesn't, he doesn't do the American accent. Because yeah. he knows that's the hook for uh, Britney Katz. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's, for all the Britney Katz out there, he's, <laughs> he's thinking about me. Thinking yeah. about you. Um, well, you're Brittany saying there's a chance. You about <laughs> there's a chance. There's a chance. <laughs> Other person that might be in your top five is uh, Emilio Estevez in your top five. <laughs> uh, you know, he was at one point when I first Breakfast saw him, they were probably in Mighty Dogs. <laughs> um, I bring him up only because um, it kind of sucked. Like last week, like I guess towards the end of the week, there's a Mighty Ducks TV show on Disney Plus, which is, you know, based on the popular, it's weird to say film trilogy. I can't believe there's three of them. Um, and of course, he came. Uh, back as uh, his character from those films and like the first season did well for them even though they won't release figures they said it did well and they renewed it for season two um fast forward to now they announced that he's not going to be on the second season and the story that was pushed out there was that he was going back and forth with the studio about not getting vaccinated and disney is one of those studios that is mandating it for people working on their sets he came out today and said that's not why he left he actually when he filmed season one he finally got COVID in March of last year I guess he had like what they call like kind of like long haul effects from it mm -hmm. where like the symptoms that he's had have lingered with him for like a very long time after you know getting rid of it and he filmed season one through all that even though he didn't feel 100% and he basically said that when it came to season two that even though he respected the integrity of the show and wanted to do it he had to like care about himself more and his health and decided not to do it hmm. he did kind of say he's like he ended it with saying i'm not anti-vax but I'm am, i am anti-bullying which kind of was a reference to some of the like studio people and other people that they're like referencing in the original story that said this is the reason why he's not coming back because he refuses to get vaccinated and he was trying to make a point like hey all that stuff that they're saying about me that's not why I had to leave and he kind of wanted to put his narrative out there and hopefully people buy it. I don't really think he's lying. I don't think like, he said the only thing he regrets is that he didn't reveal it publicly earlier, but he wanted to like just work through the show and kind of not make it about him having COVID and just wanted to focus on the fact that they got season one out there and like he was proud of it and you know, stuff like that. What I will say about him being a part of the project is it's not going to make or break it. People are going to watch this. This show is not catered for Emilio Estevez fan club. It's catered for kids that, are, that were the same age that we were when we first watched Mighty Ducks. Mm -hmm. And I I don't know about the show. I actually didn't even know it was a thing. And that's cool that he was a part of it for the first season. And I love that. Um, but he doesn't need to be a part of it anymore. And I don't think they're going to lose their fan base because he's no longer attached to the project. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that it's it's a show that we all it's a it's a idea that we all fell in love in. It's a team aspect and it's about loss and victory. And that that's the heart of the show, not Emilio Estevez. So 
I think mm-hmm. that regardless of his stance and his vaccination proof or whatever it is, I think that the show will be successful continuing on. I'm going to play devil's yeah. advocate for just a second. Only because like I see what you're saying and that it is a show aimed at kids and but there is a huge like nostalgia factor to uh, the Mighty Ducks for people like you know my age that grew up with the movies, right? So mm-hmm. I, I think a lot of those people are also at least checked it out. And if you take out the person who was like the face of that, that was the face of the three movies that you you know loved as a kid, like will like an old, the older audience that kind of grew up with that movie will movies will they want to watch uh, a show without him? You know, like some people already jokingly said, like, you know, bring back Charlie Conway. And I was Joshua Jackson in the movies. Like, mm-hmm. like you know, Joshua Jackson is not going to do the Mighty Ducks. He's busy with real things. Way above that. <laughs> um, yeah. He actually still has a pretty solid career. So unless, I mean, he might get him to do like a little cameo or something just to be like, hey, like, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, like, whatever. But like, I think that is the hook for a lot of these shows that they bring back. They, you know, like, you know, say by the Bell and Peacock, they got, you know, it was important for them to get Wonder Years to come back. Um, I think it also house. was like yeah, Cobra Kai. House, yeah. yeah, Cobra Kai. But but yeah. these these other shows we're listing have more more than just one throwback character in them. Yeah, I mean the Wonder Years is such a classic, and for them to actually put the African American spin on the show because those years were so significant for the uh, that side of the world as well um, is so interesting, and I I love the show. Um, but and those t- those types of people are still watching primetime TV, I think. Like, my parents yeah. and I are still watching that kind of stuff, whereas the younger generation has no interest in the Wonder Years right now, you mm-hmm. know? Right. Um, but they're interested in Mighty Ducks, and they're, it, they're, they're watching Disney Plus more than anyone. There's uh, no marketing for Mighty kids. Ducks, which is, I think, it, I, I mean, I didn't see any sort of marketing for Mighty Ducks, so I think yeah. that was more of a... Yeah, I'm guessing like a parent who had seen Mighty Ducks and was like, "Oh my gosh, I'm sitting here watching Disney Plus with my kids. Let's throw this on." Like that. That's mm-hmm. got to be sort of like. And Emilio Estevez has been. I mean, he's part of a very questionable family. I mean, he's he's a questionable character. They didn't probably have to t- pay him a lot of money to be a part of this project. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> You're he was an easy that. get. I don't think he was busy. <laughs> Yeah. Wasn't that like, yo, Emilio, he's like, I'll do it. <laughs> yeah. What's the project? I'll do it. Does he still have an agent? <laughs> yeah. No, they, they have his home phone. Yeah. He to, yeah. He was for a phone call. I mean, please give me work. Charlie Sheen is his brother. <laughs> yeah, he's Charlie. I mean, Charlie, yeah, he's Charlie Sheen's brother, and his dad's Martin Sheen. Like, you know, just because he's an Estevez doesn't mean he's still not a Sheen. So, like, he's still, a, he's like a part of, like, a, I don't want to say dynasty. That's what we call them that. But it's still, like, a big celebrity, like, family. Can you call the Sheens a dynasty? Oh, I, mean, well, I, I took it back as I thought about who was in it. Um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> maybe a notorious dynasty, but. Yeah, very notorious. Dynasty. But, yeah, I mean. Infamous. I mean, I respect, I respect his reason for not wanting to do it. Like, if, that, if that's really the case, that like, he was like, hey, I kind of struggled health-wise while I was filming the first season and I don't want to put myself through that again then yeah that's perfectly fine I mean it does like his the story that got spun on Friday brought up a bigger discussion about like having like those kind of mandates on film and tv sets yeah I think mm-hmm. we're gonna start seeing a lot of this happening uh soon here especially in LA with the county guidelines um being mm-hmm vaccinated and showing proof of vaccines the film industry has been one of the toughest industries uh on that um a job that i had previously before i i was in my current position uh i was this was just this past year i was getting a COVID test every week and i wasn't even coming in contact with anyone sometimes um but and everyone was we had to show our vaccination card we were all vaccinated working on sets but um i still had to get tested every week so the this industry is going to be hit hard by these mandates i think and we're going to start seeing the outliers coming out yeah i mean there's a lot yeah so (laughs) so here's the here's the deal too i I think some some people have voiced concerns that it's not right to kind of out these people um because i i brought up the thing before we started but like ice cube walked away from a nine million dollar payday for a movie because he didn't want to get vaccinated. What a privilege. Now that mm. got put out there by Deadline. And the, the thing was like, well, why did Deadline like 
out him. Like that. Why did they say like that was the reason? They could have just said that he like left the project. Didn't want to be a part of the project or something. <laughs> or... But that there, a lot of people were upset that these people are being outed. Like I got, I got a tidbit from my mother because this is not really our audience, but it's interesting because it's the same, uh, same idea. There's an actor on General Hospital who plays Jasper Jackson. I'm reading this from my mom. Ooh. Um. He this is, is so big versus, to, is I used this... to be a big General Hospital yeah, fan. He's a when he's, I was um, anti-vaxxer. And I guess General Hospital is the only soap right now that is mandating that everyone, like cast and crew, once they enter that sound stage, they have to be vaccinated. Yeah. And they had till November yeah. 1st to do that. He did not do that. And they're letting him go. They're just going to mm-hmm. write it out. Um, I mean, I, mean, I, I, I think that. that kind of, and the, but, they, but he also kind of got outed, not only by like the like publications, but I guess like, his fellow cast members who were like didn't really want to work with him there were people yeah. that didn't see with him because i think i think i mean it's it's funny because i'm actually in my apartment complex right now they're filming an episode of the um the flight attendant the kaylee cuoco hbo show and it's just like an episode or they're doing a scene or something but the amount of people that are around that are part of a production i mean i can see it firsthand and first of all it's annoying as hell because there's no fucking parking but <laughs> Um, <laughs> but I mean, just seeing the amount of people that are involved, like with the studio and the setup. So I understand that the mandates are going to be a little bit more strict and stringent because I mean, there's hundreds, if not in certain big budget films, thousands of jobs that are affected and thousands of people that can potentially be affected by this kind of thing. Whereas if you work at, I don't know, Popeye's and you're going to a shift with four other people. I mean, that, that's a little bit different. I mean, obviously you're working with customers, but I'm just trying to think of the amount of jobs that are actually involved of making a production and how close a contact you're getting in with people. So I can understand why the mandates are are, are going to be put in place is just because of the amount of people that are- right. And there's, like, uh, there's, like a, and there's also money and time that goes into this, right? So like, if you happen to, if you happen to be an anti-vaxxer and then you get COVID and then come to set, and test positive for it like you they have to shut down everything for like was it two weeks um so, yeah i mean they have to do a full quarantine of everyone so like now you're just like like it costs like most of these productions needs to be on like a schedule right so like yeah it delays it delays the effects it affects uh post-production it affects delivering properly the whole process it's it Oh my gosh, this a two week, two weeks can be a huge significant amount of time. Right. And so like, you know, I would, you know, if I was working on something like that and one bad apple who's like, I refuse to like get this and then ends up getting sick. And, and like, I think let's, let's just say like you didn't even give it to me. Let's just say like, no, well, now I have to like like I what what a lot of these people have like other projects they have up next, right? Yeah, so like you just shut have be responsible for shutting something down for two weeks because you got COVID because you didn't want to get vaccinated. And <laughs> and before these vaccination mandates, um, before we had the mandates in place, uh, there were things like if you've had a test within the last X amount of days the, and you tested negative, you're cleared also, or you're gonna have to take conferences from another room or there are different things that we can do to accommodate the people that don't want to get vaccinated. And these people are saying they don't want to do that either. Mm -hmm. And that, that I think is really significant. And that sets the tone for, I mean, that, that in my head is like, okay, you really don't care then. You're not taking anything. They're not trying to work with any of the sort of. You're not willing to do anything to help anyone else out on set. And like, that means what else are you going to not sacrifice later on? when it comes to not just vaccines, but just like, I don't, I mean, I've been on a film set one time, this girl, this girl uh, cut her, slit her entire hand open on like a metal broom that had a a a thing in it. And she just, her skin just ripped right down her hand and it was metal. And we were in the middle of nowhere in Missouri. (laughs) (laughs) We were in like, we were in ghost town, Missouri. Um, And (laughs) I had to, I was the only person with her and I had to figure out what to do. And she had to get a tetanus shot. She could have died. Right. <laughs> and, right. and we, I was like, I don't know what the procedures are. I don't know what the protocol is for any of this. Do you need a tetanus? Like, what if she was like, I'm against tetanus shots. 
Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, yeah, right. like uh, okay, well, well, you're gonna bleed out and you're gonna get you're infected. You're gonna die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's like uh, these vaccines are in place for a reason and it's to protect everyone there. And it, it's unfortunate that these actors are not able to follow simple guidelines. Yeah. I was actually kind of surprised that a lot of, Holly, I mean, I, I guess speaking to people who are more in the know about it, they were saying, I was told that I would be surprised by how many big actors don't want to get it don't want to get the vaccine like I was like really I thought really like most of like Hollywood was like especially because of how it kneecapped I mean considering how liberal all of Hollywood is you think I was like really surprised they were like no there are some big names and it's either it's a matter of like do you want to upset the big name and like you need to do this because you know we need the big name because the big name sells tickets are I mean, we saw it in football with Aaron Rodgers. He's not vaccinated. He got COVID. And now it's like, now <laughs> like he can't play. And they lost against the Chiefs. And he lied. And they they let him keep playing, even though they the NFL says they didn't know, but they knew. They had they definitely to knew. They, I mean, he's one of the biggest names in the game. So how they can were they letting him known? play. Yeah. By the he way, sells this tickets. He sells the... marketing. He sells media. But I think they're doing the same thing with, with famous actors in these films. I think they're kind of looking the other direction when it comes to stuff like this. I think the mandates are in place for a reason and everyone is trying to be safe. But I think that like you guys were saying, these big names, they need the big names. And apparently there's a shortage of actors in Hollywood (laughs) because Chris Pratt is in literally everything. So I hope he's Uh, Chris Pratt and Idris Elba. And (laughs) you know, we can have them. (laughs) Like there's just like this rotating door of actors. It's like, can we just, can we not find another actor to be in that movie if this well, one's not back today? I, I find heard, one that is. Yeah, I mean, I, I heard this podcast. I think they it was might be Matt, cheaper. I think it was the a Matt Damon episode or some uh, some interview with Matt Damon. He was just kind of saying that there is sort of like a list, like it's an unspoken list that uh, he was on for a while. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. I mean, it's kind of like an unspoken list where it's like once you've kind of like if you're on the list, you're gonna get asked for a lot of parts. And once you kind of said that, I started noticing it. I think Chris Pratt, Idris Elba, um, Nicole Kidman's been on it for a while, but I think that there's like a lot of different actors and actresses that are, they kind of come and go and sometimes they reappear. It's the who you know game. But I, I, I mean, I think you said it perfectly, Brittany. I mean, Chris Pratt's in everything now and he's just the kind of like, he's the first call on the sheet when you have a, a male star. It's yeah, crazy. It's and maybe, and guess what? He might be vaccinated, so that, that might be one. Of his. The internet has not been. Too I hope he is. I didn't realize that. Like the internet was like. Okay, well, he he he, he hasn't been liked because he was cast as what Mario. Well, it, okay, it's, it started out silly. He it got he got cast as the voice of Mario, which he was like, it's a dream come true, right? And everyone was like, "Why? He's not Italian." Like they all like they went like everyone on the line went. Like, the character's <laughs> fake. But it's the whole that, wait, 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 fake. hold on. While we're talking about that, the, like Garfield he's not too. Italian, but he's playing this actor. Um, well, they they cast Catherine Hahn to play Joan Rivers, exactly. a Jewish woman. Jewish woman, yeah. And she's not Jewish. She's not so, Jewish. yeah, it's true. I mean, and then like if we're getting same. technical, like in the in the really bad Super Mario Brothers movie, like it's John Leguizamo and like Ben uh, Bob Hoskins who are not Italian at all. So like it shouldn't matter. Like it's also a video game. It's not real. But like they were upset. It's, it's, fake, it's, it's a fake character who's Italian. fake Italian. But that was the one thing that triggered them. They were like, "Oh, all you got to do is go, woohoo, and you're good to go." Like you know, like <laughs> all you got to do is be able to do the no, voice. No, he, he, um, Chris Pratt made a thing on Instagram about his current wife, um, Catherine Schwarzenegger, and said, "Like, thank you, I love you. You gave me a healthy, beautiful baby girl." Meanwhile, it's very well known that he has a, a son with. Anna Ferris, mm-hmm. and he it, he has had a lot of medical um, he issues growing up. So lot, it was kind of a slap in the face. Life. Yeah, a lot of people were tricked. They were, they all jumped to the defense of Anna Ferris and said like it was in poor taste of him to say thank you to his current wife for giving him a healthy you know daughter. Oh shit! Okay. Like, the you know his wow. wife, the son that he has with her that you know his child had a lot of he's like thanks thanks for a good one but uh my previous I mean, can one you imagine can you imagine being the son and hearing oh your daughter is re- or your sister is super healthy great oh but you had 
you know, you have some issues, but, but we're so glad that we have a healthy right. baby girl. And like, like that is, I want so, to that is so traumatizing to the son. I hope he doesn't ever hear that. Yeah, that his dad said that. Intention was like no negative. Like I like I think a lot of people were like really going at him because it. I was like he didn't like. Of course he didn't like mean that. But I guess I can see like in hindsight how like it can be read like in poor taste to say it. Like was, was, is, is that one of the backlashes? Is that the main backlash he's got? I mean, the only thing that I heard was Mario, and yeah, then he also the, signed on for. I mean, I was People gonna roast like him because of them. I was yeah, gonna I kinda, roast I kinda, him. I brought up the Mario thing because it did start there. I, like, I remember like, why him? And then he got cast to do the voice of Garfield. And then I was gonna say I was gonna roast him for doing Garfield. That? Even and Bill then, Murray said he hated doing that. So, so I, think, I think BuzzFeed was like one of the first people to point out the Instagram post, and they kind of wrote a scathing like story. Oh, about so it. they're and, looking for something to and, go after. Like, him, I think of. they actually like pulled a lot of like Twitter responses about what he said, and a lot of them were like how dare you like you, you know, how could you say that about your son like the it, only it thing is that negativity i wish i wish he would have just made a statement that said you know that that wasn't my intentions i love my my kids equally um uh, they're beautiful children in their own way like i i don't know something about like how he still loves both of his kids the same way that he would love anyone you know i don't know mm-hmm. Yeah. He just didn't, he didn't make any statement, which could have been a statement in itself where if he's not, he's just not going down to that level where he is willing to give it airtime. Right. And it was so, crazy. It starts out as like a really nice appreciation post about his wife, like just talking about, you know, her. Well, people and, also think that he's a little psycho about his wife. Yeah. <laughs> and so like their also, marriage. Know, I, I actually put something on Facebook and I put like, I had no idea that the internet. I saw that. Yeah, I saw that. Threat. But then, like, I think my friend Ray wrote, like, well, it's because he's a conservative in Hollywood. That's why. And there was, like, that kind of started that kind of. Oh, my went down that. So And now he, he said not only conservative, but a Christian conservative. So, like, so there was, like, all that kind of got thrown into it. And, like, that's yeah, just that opening up. Do I don't even want to talk about yeah, that. So it's like, a, like, that's, that's just, I don't even want to go a, down that path. Yeah. Well, it's you know, just it's, that's a ridiculous claim. It's it has, that, nothing, it's that it has nothing to do with his political affiliation. Yeah, the reason uh, that he's playing Clifford and Mario is the problem. He's wait, he's Clifford too. Uh, Garfield, Garfield. I mean, or really, Garfield, whatever. He, another, you know, he was Clifford too. Another big fat animal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, we won't go down that road, but we can go down a fun uh, little feud road as uh, we get close to wrapping things up. Uh, everyone knows that. Uh, Dwayne Johnson and Vin Diesel mm. get along. Now I can't tell if it's like Dwayne Johnson doesn't really like Vin Diesel, or I think that's it. Both. <laughs> um, there was an incident on set. Yeah, so like, well, I'll go a little Fast and the Furious like history a little bit. Um, before Fast Five came out, which was like the first one that Dwayne Johnson was in, uh, Vin Diesel pretty much asked the fans like who do you want to see like Dominic Toretto kind of go head to head with and they all said right. Dwayne Johnson so that's how the Dwayne Johnson thing came to be and like so it was it actually kind of was like a fan base it was a fan driven kind of thing and like you know even though that fourth movie where they brought everyone back did well the Fast Five by a lot of fans of that franchise is considered the best one to a lot of them they they, they and they credit a lot of that to including Dwayne Johnson like he added like an a element aspect that, to that it. franchise need, right? So everything yeah. seems to be running smoothly, I guess, like five and six. And something happened on, like, I only thought this only happened on the Fate of the Furious, but from what Dwayne Johnson has talked about, it seemed like these problems arose earlier. And he won't go into specific details, but the one thing that he did while they were making the Fate of the Furious is that he made that very public Instagram post calling certain people on the film candy asses for not being professional <laughs> and it became very widely known, widely known that he was talking about Vin Diesel. Vin Diesel. Now the word on the curb is that Vin Diesel is very uh very hard to work with. Hard to, like not uh, I guess hard to work with be kind of like a little bit of a stretch. I guess he has some like diva like behavior where he'll show up late like you know you're kind of on his time and this franchise is his baby, so he probably feels that like he can, he can do kind of do what he wants. Um, I always kind of point to like some people have pointed out. Well, it doesn't seem like Michelle Rodriguez or Jordana Brewster or anyone Helen Mirren, like because she's been in those movies too. Like no one else has really said anything negative about him. 
other than this kind of situation with Dwayne Johnson and him. So I guess kind of like, I don't know if he kind of felt the heat because like Dwayne Johnson has brought this up again because Vin Diesel recently said the reason that he was so hard on him while they were making all those movies because like Dwayne Johnson's coming from like a WWE background and I kind of wanted to bring out the most out of him as like a, a real legitimate actor, which is also kind of, it sounds like a backhanded like- Yeah, that's <laughs> a backhanded compliment. compliment. Uh, um, so Dwayne Johnson basically said, you know what? I'm not going to speak on this anymore. I kind of laugh when I read that, but here's the deal. Like I'm fully involved with like doing Hobbs and Shaw too, because that's yeah. kind of the fast franchise, but I'm not making Fast 10. I wish them all the best. I don't have any ill will towards anyone on that movie. I hope it's successful. He wanted that to be the kind of the end of it. And then he kind of spoke on it some more, basically saying that he wishes that he doesn't regret what he said the first time, mm-hmm. but he does regret making it public, like on Instagram and like having everyone kind of hear about it. So yeah. I guess when people, like seeing all that, like wanted to reach out to him because they're, you know, they're working, they're developing Fast 10, which is going to be... It seemed like a fake post to me. It seemed like um, a, like, the post was very, like, very, like, back. wasn't like, it didn't feel genuine. It was kind of like, you know... He like, called him little brother. Little brother. And then, like, every, like, my kids in the house called you, like, Uncle, like, Uncle Dwayne or whatever. The Uncle Dwayne. Said. And, like, we really want you to come back for Fast 10. It would, it's what Pablo would want. And Pablo, of course, is Paul Walker and like you know of course yeah you don't do that that's kind of like, that's kind of messed at, up like, like pulling at the the heartstrings in a very public way to get him to come they're back. fine they're fine they're friends they are the contracts oh, are the ink's already dry on the contracts they're doing this shit it's bullshit they're <laughs> posting about this on Instagram because they know it's gonna feed to uh because yeah, how are they gonna all sell the people two- that wanted the rock to be in in the fifth movie like you said uh, they voted for him to be in it, and now they're trying to get the fans involved again. Well, also, and, h- how are you going to try and promote a part one and part two fast ending? Like, how could it not just be one movie? Gonna end up, he's yeah, gonna so end up that's, a, that's something a, back, and he's going to yeah, say that's know. a really interesting angle, right? Because they're developing it, right? But like, you know, they they're supposed to start filming on it like early next year, so like they would have to know they if already know who he's going to come back in some capacity or not. Like they, bullshit. They would, yeah. they would need to know that. My only my only argument against that is like it doesn't seem like Dwayne Johnson would need to do that to sell a movie. Like he personally if he's in a movie, it's gonna get tickets sold. Like I, this I, wasn't I, his idea. Oh, this was talking? Vin Diesel's idea. I, don't, I mean, I don't like the idea before. that like Vin Diesel is this, like <laughs> smart mastermind. It's like concocting this big marketing. Uh, I no, think those are two like, words. Whatever, those like, are two words that no one has ever want. associated with Vin Diesel as smart <laughs> or mastermind. <laughs> mastermind. Yeah. No, I think I think we've all seen this scenario play out before. It's like those two guys at the bar that um, we're all friends, but always super competitive with each other. And one of them's five eight, and the other one's six foot. And there's always that little like uh, some the six foot guy gets more girls. The five eight guy has a better personality. I but they're always going to be fighting. Who is who? They're always going to be five eight. Diesel, right? Diesel's five eight for sure. Vin Diesel's definitely five yeah. eight. Uh, yeah, I mean, I could see it being publicity. So I, I just it just it just seemed, just seemed like a weak. If it's publicity, like that's a weak. Wait, 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 this is like Taylor Swift and now. and Jonas Brothers. Right. tweeting about each other I, mean, I do believe that the yeah. ego, i do believe the ego thing is real though for those two i mean like i think that maybe that there i agree that there could have been a clash at some point where, i think that vin I mean, diesel has had a I mean, little bit of a clash that he didn't do he didn't participate in fast nine uh he keeps talking about how he doesn't want to do fast 10 because it's not an environment he wants to work in and like he keeps talking around it but like, i think I, vin diesel kind of has this sort of chip on his shoulder i mean the rock came in and everything he's done has gotten at least some sort of response um and vin diesel's got the fast in the fast movies i mean that's that's yeah, what he's got I mean, like he's, he's got triple has, x he like he's got some done. sort of other movies he's got some triple x he has that whatever that blood sport movie or whatever it is but <laughs> he hasn't really gone out of his way and made skyscraper or like oh, he, he hasn't he hasn't become like the rock overshadows him not just height wise, but right. but, but like also the Sarah well, the is like, Kim Cattrall. Yeah, it's a, it's a very similar situation where oh, Kim Cattrall, nice. Samantha Jones is not coming back to Sex and the City or the new um spinoff, uh, and just like that. Yeah. Um, and and there were rumors for a minute that she would be coming back, 
possibly. And I think if the money is right for both of them, I think with The Rock, if the money is right, or with uh, Kim Cattrall, I think in both those situations, you can't say no to a paycheck when it gets well, to a yeah, certain amount of dollars. The argument there too is a, like- hey, Ice Cube said no to nine mil, so I, apparently you can <laughs> say no to a paycheck. Yeah, you can, apparently. <laughs> but Dwayne Johnson doesn't really need the fact. He's so rich. He I has know, so much a, money. He's I don't the highest think he paid actor it. in Hollywood. I mean, he's, yeah. the, he's the biggest movie star probably working today. I mean, it, his movies, for the most part, all do very well. Like, and like, there, there's an argument to be made that like the fast movies became big, like international grocers. Yeah. Once he got included in them. Oh, really? I didn't <laughs> know that. That's five where they all kind of took off. Like, I thought they were always international. So Vin like, Diesel knows Dress. that maybe. I think Vin, Vin Diesel, Diesel knows that he's a big, huge part of that. Successful. Like overseas, they like they've had they've had like an overseas footprint before, but like they weren't making like five, six, seven, eight, nine hundred million dollars worldwide until he got involved. Maybe Vin Diesel know. is worried that that they're gonna the ending's gonna lose suck. interest. Right. They're and gonna lose interest if it, if he's not a part of the project. I'm like, you know, Vin Diesel should just be happy. I mean, like Fast Nine came out this summer, and even in the throes of like the pandemic and like movie going not being 100 percent back, it made over 700 million dollars worldwide. And like I, everyone's gonna be like, oh, that's less than the last one, but it's also coming out in a very different, you know, climate for the box office. So like he still has, like, it's still a viable franchise. He doesn't really need, I think there are maybe some, if, if it's if it's on the publicity stunt, like, maybe there's just some murmurs from the studio, like, fix this. Because, yeah. like, <laughs> like we, want, yeah. we want to have him back. They're like, you're an idiot. <laughs> like, figure this out. Get the rock back. Yeah. yeah. It should have been done over a fucking phone call, not on Instagram. Not which on Instagram. Why it does come off like a publicity stunt. These dads on Instagram. <laughs> but, like, yeah. but it's just, like, but I, if it, yeah, if it's not political, Uncle Dwayne, come back. Yeah, out <laughs> a way to make him come back. He's appealing to all the emotions and yeah, and, 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 post. and I, you know what? I even read the comments underneath the post. I don't know why I didn't. I should have because I wanted to know if like people. I didn't either. No, because <laughs> I'm really curious if they were like, "Man, this is your fault, bro," or if they were like, "Yeah, Dwayne, come on back. We miss you." Or I don't know. It's like show up for work on time. Maybe the Rock will be there. Um, the Rock I, does have a very strict schedule. With I mean, he's he's posted at his routine his like daily routine and it's very by the minute so yeah. if people are going to be late he's probably pissed about that yeah yeah i mean yeah he's, he's, he's a professional he, guy like, what i've heard about him he seems to be like uh, like the constant like professional and uh, and he that's great though he runs his you know even if it's not his production company that's doing the movie like he runs his sets in a very professional way and if if one of the lead actors is uh not doing what he should be doing and not only a lead actor like vin diesel's a producer on it so like he's acting like a super senior out here and he's just yeah. putting his feet up on the table that's my doing final lap yeah, like exactly like like and like, the rock is like military time like let's get this shit going i yeah. mean but vin diesel's like we're gonna be making 700 million dollars why do i have to show up on time yeah like he's like i don't even have to try anymore like it's like, like, but it's like <laughs> if i were a crew member on this set and vin diesel made me late you know, these, these crew members are there for 14 plus hours a day, yeah. more than the actors. So yeah. Vin Diesel, I was on a project with P Diddy and P Diddy made us two hours late. That two hours made my day 12 hours total instead of 10. So that day was an extremely long day. Mm -hmm. I had to find someone, you know, it's, it's just, there's a lot that goes into uh, Come when on, an actor P. is Diddy. late. It like when when if Vin Diesel is gonna be late to set every day or or not on time for his his You're call just gonna time, dread the project. Everyone's gonna hate working with him, and he's gonna become the mortal enemy of this whole project. Even yeah. though he's got so many, he's a producer, whatever. People are not gonna want to work with him. Right, exactly. And like I I remember like I brought it up earlier, but I pointed out to someone else like why haven't other cast members said anything about him? And they, I, I was told like, well, they know where their bread's butter. They're not gonna like, Donald Brewster is not gonna be like, yeah, he's an asshole. They're used <laughs> like, to it, man. They're probably used to it too. They don't want to. They, they want to stay out of it. Years, so like, you know, this is what like they've been with him longer. They so, understand like, like how he works, like and it's like this is how it works. Or they're like, I don't want to upset like Papa Ben. I'm trying to get this paycheck. <laughs> he's, yeah. that, he's that friend that you tell like dinner starts at six thirty when it actually starts at seven. Yeah. Yeah. And they probably know that about him. And like, mm -hmm. and I'm sure other than the fact that he might be a diva and show up late, he might just, he might be a nice dude. It's just probably like, 
he might just be a little entitled, which is. I know we were joking about him being five eight, but isn't he actually short in real life? He's short. Um, <laughs> they're, they're actually so there's scenes in like Fast Five, especially when like Dwayne Johnson and him have to fight. And oh God, that must be a nightmare to produce. They frame the shots as if they're like the same height, and like we're not the same, not even close to the same. Dwayne Johnson's like what six four? Yeah, and Vin the Vin Rock D- has like 150 <laughs> pounds on that guy, at least easily. Yeah, and I'm like, and I'm sure that Vin Diesel told like. Yeah, Justin Lin directed the fifth one. He's probably like, man, just make sure like I look about the same height <laughs> as Dwayne Johnson. Like, please. Like, like when you want, like, there's actually people actually. Okay, I looked it up. Vin Diesel six foot. And but the but Rock, the Rock six, six five. five. So yeah, I just yeah. looked it up too. So you have all that like machismo going on. <laughs> like you know, I'm sure like they both have egos. I mean, <laughs> Ludacris is five eight. So that's it's- the one they got to work around. <laughs> <laughs> and is, like a he just happened to be there <laughs> it's two alphas it's two alphas working on set and that it, that's never a good combination we've seen this story before with actors that don't get along when there's a lot of tension on set mm-hmm. i hate to bring it up again but sex in the city samantha jones character kim cattrall left because she wasn't getting paid the same amount as sarah jessica parker when sarah jessica parker never had to have naked scenes and they relied on Samantha Jones for all of those scenes. Mm. Um, and I do think that is unfair. That yeah. th- there's two alpha personalities and it right. wasn't fair that they weren't getting paid the same. Well, isn't there like, is there like argument with that? And I could be wrong because I'm not like a huge like follower of Sex and City. But Sarah Jessica, Parker, Sarah Jessica Parker is like the star. I mean, I know it's an ensemble, but like she's a star, right? And like... I thought she created the idea. And, I, and at the time, I don't even remember, mm-hmm. at the time when that show started, was she, like Sarah Jessica Parker, a bigger name than Kim Cattrall? Or was Kim, or was Kim Cattrall like the name? I don't think they, I don't think any of them really had big names. Um, and, and the show is supposed to be following the four of them. Uh, it did later on progress more towards SJP's side just because she narrates it. But... Right. Um, but it follows four ladies living in New York and in their lives. And I, I just think that Sarah Jessica Parker and her contract made it known that she would not do sex scenes on a show called where she showed, where she showed nudity. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so, and Kim Cattrall, that was what she was known for. She was known for being quote unquote, the slut. Um, of the in group the show and or just in the show, yeah. Her character, show, Samantha yeah. Jones, was like the the one having the most sex on yes. the show. She's very like um, blunt and very crass about like her sex life and the stuff that she does. Like she like is arguably for most people that watch it the funniest character on the show because she's just so she has no filter. Yeah. Um, she was the most she was the most relatable, honestly. And and as you as women get older, they relate more to Samantha's character or Miranda's character rather than Sarah Jessica Parker's character, who is actually a very toxic friend. Mm. Right. And they have never really gotten along. I mean, I, I know for some girls I know who have watched who watched that show over the years, finding out that they didn't get along uh, killed the allure for some of them watching it because like, it's built around this whole, like, they're, like, four best friends. Mm. And then when you find mm. out there's, they like... legitimately hate each other around. in real life. And I kind of get the, yeah. like, the idea, like the hey, other. Hey, sounds story. like some other uh, girlfriend groups that I've uh, known throughout the years. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I also get the idea that like Kristen Davis and Cynthia Nixon, like I, they may even feel the same way that Kim Cattrall does, but they're like, I want to stay for this money. Yeah, <laughs> so, it's, it's like, you know, like I mean, people in those roles get typecasted and they can't leave that role, and I think that. Kim Cattrall felt that, that she couldn't really do anything else besides that show because she had let it all out on that show. She showed herself in such vulnerable positions that um, she had a hard time getting other roles. She was, she was trying to get roles at where she played like the mom in like Disney movies and she couldn't get those, those roles. Uh, Yeah. I mean, it's unfortunate too, because like they also publicly kind of shamed her a little bit when well, they were trying to make the third movie and they were like mm-hmm. we have this really good idea but there's like one holdout and it was clearly her and she yeah. said something like she was like you know what you present me with the script you're showing me is not up to what I want to do yeah want to do. it's not and, my character not who I want to be yeah but they all kind of like every even like the lower tier people on the cast like some of the men who have supporting roles were like 
well, it's her fault. We're not doing another one. Like, kind of like put it on her. And she's like, if I don't feel like the project's any good, then uh, I'm not gonna do I it. Do, I don't care like how much of a following it has. Like, I still like that I did the show. It did a lot for my career, but I'm not just gonna milk something just to milk it. Yeah, and, and that's how the Rock probably feels about this project too. He's like, I don't really need it. Yeah, Why no, he doesn't. I? He, I mean, he's making. He's dedicated. To the show. <laughs> he's willing to do that. <laughs> like, yeah, it's it's crazy. But because yeah, Vin Diesel's not in it. Yeah, yeah, nowhere near it. I don't even know if he gets a producing credit on there, right? Even though it's a fast franchise movie, does Vin Diesel have any like? Uh, he yeah. might be a producer, but I mean, there's no way he was on set. Oh, no, not at all. And I even know, like, with the Fate of the Furious, the last one that The Rock did, before they even started filming the Fate of the Furious, he made it known like we should not have scenes together. So I, I watched that movie again a month ago, and they don't have like face to face scenes. There, there are scenes where they're in the same like shot, but they're not like physically together. Hmm. And that's uh, awkward. You can tell when when actors like don't want to be on set together. You can tell. Yeah. There's yeah. like an they're aura. not shooting together. Yeah. Well, you know who does want to be together? All uh three of us. And I think we did a really good job on our very first episode of Back to the Blockbuster. Every week. Every week. Um I should mention though that uh the Back to the Blockbuster uh Blockbuster podcast is a playlist studio original. So it's gonna be featured on their channel and they're also developing an app that it's gonna be on as well. But you can also find uh the podcast wherever you choose to listen. Playlist. We love you. Spot, uh, Spotify, iTunes, like they'll it'll be uh, in all those places, and we'll make sure to link all of them so you guys can check it out. Um, I don't know what we're gonna really talk about next week because uh, there's no Marvel movies out. So <laughs> <laughs> thank God, thank God. There's I'll no make Marvel us not talk about, about Marvel. Uh, I yeah, think, I well, we might. We might. Be, there isn't one. We I'm might, uh, excited to talk about in the future. I'm excited to talk about House of Gucci. I'm only gonna talk about yes. Yes, I was actually excited about how talking with my friend Preston though, and I was like, "Dude, the trailers and like the posters and everything, it looks like it's either going to be really great or like the worst thing ever." <laughs> like, I'm like, expecting like, very like, I great. I, I'm here for it either way because these are like I'm going to laugh if it's. Really I'm, an, I'm an Adam Driver <laughs> fan. I'm excited for Gaga to pop off again. I think only one I'm not looking forward to. I'm interested to see Leto's role. Uh, so. <laughs> interested to see how that's going to work out but i can't wait to watch that um and then talk about it with you guys and then may- maybe maybe we can find another movie that either old or somewhat new that we can start talking about and uh add that to the next next podcast yeah we can actually kind of like pick like if you guys want to pick one like we'll take turns like like yeah. hey, to watch that this week uh and it doesn't need well, choice and it doesn't we could do like two or three yeah, yeah. they're like the, like similar yeah. actors or similar genres. Let's go to prison. I'll say that. Let's let's watch. Let's all watch. Let's go. Let's go to prison. Uh, even if you uh, know, like, hour and twenty minute comedy that uh, really knocks your socks off. I think it's great. Low budget <laughs> comedy. <laughs> so. Well, what are you gonna make us watch stuff like Joe Dirt and? Okay, I will not be requesting. <laughs> I will not be saying Joe Dirt for the for you the. Billy Madison. And if you make us watch Joe Dirt, I'm gonna make you watch Honey. <laughs> look it up hey. that's that one. <laughs> i'm gonna oh. make you guys watch billy madison oh, cool no why would you do that to me cool. early on in Sanders, all right oh so why would you do that to me would you rather watch billy elliot <laughs> billy <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll oh. figure out. we'll find some good stuff to yeah watch. we got uh, this um but uh thank you for listening to our very first episode and we will uh you'll be hearing from us soon thank you guys thanks guys